Following a confrontation with the transformed Farland, which led to a divide between Laios and Soro, Laios's group remains resolute in their quest for Farland. Their journey takes them deeper, to the dungeon's sixth level, where they previously encountered the Red Dragon. Throughout this arc, we delve into the evolving dynamics of the dungeon, uncover the identity and intentions of the mad sorcerer orchestrating these events, and encounter formidable beasts. Additionally, this arc will enrich our understanding of Laios, Marcel, Chilchuk, and Senshi, shedding light on their histories, reasons for venturing into the dungeon, and more. Chilchuk expressed difficulty in locating the stairs to ascend, and ironically, upon their decision to proceed, they stumbled upon descending stairs. He couldn't shake off a deep sense of unease. Laios pointed out a fresh blood trail, suggesting Farland's recent passage down to a lower level. Laios expressed his distaste for the sixth level. Sinchi's curiosity about Laios's dislike revealed it stemmed from the level's intense heat. This underground channel, carved from ancient dwarven mines, sprawls extensively beneath the town like a labyrinth and circulatory system. Throughout history, it likely carried more than water, people, beasts, schemes, falsehoods, rumors, blood, and wealth have all possibly traversed its depths. Contrary to expectations, they found the atmosphere chillingly cold, conflicting with Laios's memory of the sixth level's warmth and humidity. This discrepancy led to speculation they might have veered off course, but Chilchuk was certain of their location, recalling the dragon's previous attack and their narrow escape. He mused that in a dungeon with shifting floors and walls, even temperature shifts aren't far-fetched, expressing a personal preference for cold over heat. Nonetheless, the snow and ice erased the vital blood trail they were following. Chilchuk proposed revisiting their previous near-disastrous site, hoping to retrieve any belongings not yet consumed by dungeon cleaners. Laios yearned for something as simple as a change of clothes, bemoaning his torn shirt, one of only two he owns, concerned for his sister's well-being in the cold nodded at him, though he consoled himself with the thought of her feathery adaptation. Chilchuk commended Laios on his previous bluff, expressing hope that Laios had formulated a plan by now. Laios, slightly hesitant, revealed that Farlin had been on a quest to find someone named Durgal under the Mad Sorcerer's commands. This directive was the reason the Red Dragon roamed floors it typically wouldn't in a restless search. Sinchi pondered the name Durgal, while Chilchik, feeling a sense of familiarity with the name, wondered about the person's identity. Marcel clarified that Durgal was the name of a king, the ruler of a golden capital that fell into ruin a millennium ago, with texts throughout the dungeon praising him. Chilchik recalled artifacts bearing the king's name and Laios's account of King Durgal's appearance and subsequent disintegration upon the dungeon's discovery. Since she deduced that the mad sorcerer's quest was to find the long-lost king, driving the dragon to its limits and altering the dungeon's layout to facilitate the search. Laios elaborated on the sorcerer's motivations, rooted in the historical assassination of the prior king, which instilled a fear for King Durgal's safety. Marcel questioned the source of Laios's tale, wondering if it was mere fantasy. Laios confirmed the encounter's reality, recounting a moment within the painting that led to an altercation. The revelation surprised his companions, who were hearing this for the first time. Laios admitted his obliviousness to the significance of these encounters at the time. Marcel recognized that Laios had been experiencing historical moments, leading Chilchik to inquire about the sorcerer's elven identity and the longevity of elves. Marcel responded that ancient records suggest elves could live for a thousand years, but in modern times, an elf's lifespan typically does not exceed 500 years. Chilchik proposed that if the sorcerer can manipulate the life force of others at will, extending their own lifespan might seem trivial. However, Marcel dismissed the idea comparing self-induced longevity through magic to the futility of trying to nourish oneself by consuming one's own body. She recounted that ancient sorcerers worldwide had once sought the secret to eternal life, but all efforts proved fruitless, cementing the quest's impossibility. Laios pondered whether the sorcerer's hostility stemmed from a belief that they were adversaries of the king, suggesting that a direct conversation might dispel this misapprehension, though his companions expressed skepticism. As the wind intensified, rendering visibility nearly impossible, Laios urged the group to maintain physical contact to prevent separation in the harsh conditions. He led them to seek refuge in a nearby passage to escape the worsening blizzard. 
Ensuring they were all accounted for in the darkness, Lyos requested Marcel to conjure light, revealing they had stumbled upon an ancient prison's remnants. His initial relief at their safety turned to confusion upon realizing their numbers had inexplicably doubled. Lyo speculated on the presence of shapeshifters, entities from his homeland known to mimic travelers or animals during inclement weather, blending undetected into groups. Chilchik remarked on the perilous nature of Lyos's homeland. While Lyos admitted his knowledge of shapeshifters came from hearsay rather than personal encounters, Marcel questioned if these beings were a type of fairy, prompting curiosity from Chilchik about their intentions. Lyos ominously warned that unrecognized shapeshifters could consume their originals, usurping their identities. This revelation prompted an urgent discussion on identifying the imposters among them, with Chilchik, Senshi, and Marcel quickly casting suspicion on the duplicate Lyoses, doubting their authenticity and their understanding of monsters. Lyos explained that shapeshifters glean the thoughts of living beings to precisely mimic someone or something dear to them. He posited that the trio of Lyos's present mirrored their individual perceptions of them. Upon closer inspection, they concurred, noting subtle disparities in each other's doppelgangers. Marcel's irritation flared when addressing a counterfeit Marcel, who defiantly denied being an imposter, prompting Marcel to question from whose recollections this inferior version emerged. Chilchik identified dubious duplicates of himself and Sinchi, criticizing the inaccuracies in their appearances, he noted doesn't wear a scarf, and Sinchi's helmet lacked its characteristic perforations, suggesting these flaws originated from Lyoza's imperfect memories. With the revelation, they acknowledged six remaining shapeshifters. Marcel pondered the ethics of leaving the fakes unchecked, while Lados reassured that shapeshifters lack human intellect and likely wouldn't grasp their intentions. He speculated that aggression might provoke them, advocating for a non-violent strategy to identify and collectively address the imposters. The group questioned Lyos's ability to discern real from fake, but he maintained that side-by-side -side comparisons would reveal inconsistencies. He warned, however, that delay would allow the shapeshifters to refine their disguises based on corrected memories. Since he pointed out variations in Marcel's hairstyle among the duplicates, with Chilchik admitting his inability to recall her exact one from their last encounter, highlighting the challenge and distinguishing the genuine from the fabricated. The initial Marcel claimed her hairstyle was distinctive enough to be memorable, while the second countered that the chilly blizzard prompted her to wear her hair loose. The third highlighted the unique quality of their hair, emphasizing that for mages, hair is akin to their essence. Lyos expressed confusion, noting that all responses seemed characteristic of Marcel. Chilchik remarked that these reflections indeed stem from their mental images of Marcel, Marcel suggested revealing information known solely to her to distinguish the real from the imposters. Chilchik humorously questioned whether this would involve guessing personal details like her mother's maiden name, which Marcel dismissed. They examined their spell books, among them, one was an obvious counterfeit, yet the others appeared authentic to Laios. However, one of the Marcels criticized the grammatical errors in another's spell formulations, puzzling Chilchik about their capacity to judge spellbook grammar. Chilchik proposed examining their possessions for discrepancies. Spreading out their belongings, they exposed additional shapeshifters, narrowing the field to two duplicates per person, but the challenge intensified. With only three imposters remaining, Lyos unexpectedly suggested a meal, surprising the others. He reasoned that visual distinctions were no longer sufficient, observing them partake in routine behaviors might reveal the truth. Yet, there was skepticism regarding Lyos's observational skills, given his previous oversights, including his encounters with the mad sorcerer, misunderstanding Soro's emotions, and failing to recognize Cabru from a prior meeting. This left the group apprehensive about relying solely on his judgment. Lyos saw this as his golden opportunity to regain the group's confidence by accurately identifying the shapeshifters. Eager to make amends for past mistakes, he committed to distinguishing the real from the false with utmost diligence. Sinchi, Chilchik, and Marcel, however, harbored concerns that Lyos might mistakenly favor their doppelgangers, prompting them to take matters into their own hands. Lyos positioned himself at a distance for a meticulous observation, encouraging everyone to give their best effort, which pissed off Chilchik while Marcel wondered about their culinary creations. Senshi presented ingredients found on the fifth floor alongside supplies from Lady Mizuru. Lyos introduced an additional guideline, 
Each individual was to collaborate with their duplicate on preparing the same dish, aiming to spotlight behavioral and communicative disparities through their teamwork. Senshi assumed the role of culinary instructor as the duos commenced their cooking endeavors. In the Chilchik teams, Chilchik A settled in the room's center, busily cutting meat, whereas his counterpart utilized a wooden crate as a makeshift seat for whisking eggs and seasonings. Lyos diligently recorded their actions, drawing complaints from the pair. One Chilchik struggled with a bottle, seeking Lyos' assistance. The other Chilchik then asserted the imposter's identity, claiming an unnoticed sense of pride and convictions unique to himself. The scrutinizing eyes of the group settled on Chilchik A, noting his particularly fierce gaze. Approaching Lyos, he inquired if the distinction was apparent. Lyos concurred, recognizing a rather nasty look that flagged Chilchuk A as potentially counterfeit, a detail he decided to bear in mind. Following this interaction, Chilchuk A resorted to vulgar language, which Lyos documented, observing the common tongue used. Turning their attention to the Marcel duo, each held an egg, prompting questions about its origin. Sinchi's clarification that it was a harpy egg provoked Marcel's indignation, asserting her aversion to consuming humanoid monsters. Despite her recent concessions, she voiced frustration over the boundary being continually tested. Lyos noted Marcel B's exaggeratedly characteristic reaction, whereas Marcel A concentrated on the task at hand. Upon querying her stance, she expressed resignation over their prior consumption choices, stating her readiness to take any measures for Farland's salvation. This assertion made Marcel be anxious, fearing her authenticity was in doubt and hastily avowed her own willingness to do anything for Farlin. Chilchik disowned a notable lack of resolve in Marcel B's declaration. Contrastingly, Marcel A critiqued the effectiveness of consuming a harpy's egg on their predicament but remained committed to the task. Lyos grappled with identifying the genuine Marcel as both articulated sentiments that could believably originate from her. The Sinchi duo was next under Lyos' scrutiny. He inquired about the origin of the harpy eggs, to which Sinchi explained his discovery of a nest amidst the ruins, prompting him to collect all the eggs present. Lyos probed further, referencing Sinchi's often quoted maxim regarding eggs and their nutritional value, prompting Sinchi to affirm, eggs are nutritionally perfect. As he meticulously cooked the ingredients and in rice, seasoning them carefully, Lyos reminisced that rice was Soro's favorite dish. Since she elaborated on the comprehensive nutritional benefits vital for adventurers, attributing their procurement of the eggs to good fortune. Lyos, reflecting on his own simple desire to consume monsters, acknowledged Sinchi's profound consideration of culinary aspects such as taste and nutritional content, placing him in a league of his own. With all dishes appearing equally appetizing, Lyos realized that discerning the fakes based solely on culinary prowess would be challenging. At that moment, Marcel pointed out an observation, questioning whether they found Sinchi be unusually attractive. Lyos and Chilchik found the remark unexpected, with Chilchik noting that Sinchi's appearance had always been consistent. The two Chilchuks then engaged in a dispute over perceived dwarf prejudices, with one criticizing the other's supposed unattractive features. Lyos noted Sinchi's appearance in his notebook, highlighting the cooking's imminent completion and pondered over his judgment, confessing his uncertainty. He observed the indistinguishable authenticity and simultaneous falseness of each doppelganger, attributing the challenge to their origins and their perceptions. Acknowledging the inherent disadvantage, he mused that identifying a monster in human guise would have presented a more intriguing challenge. This reflection sparked an idea. With the meals prepared, dubbed memories of the fifth floor palaf, sweet dryad, and the entire fifth floor piccata, Lyos encouraged continuous eating while disclosing his verdict, Chilchik, A, Marcel, B, and Sinchi, A, as the originals, requesting the counterfeits to relocate to the cell promptly. Despite protests, particularly from the disputing Marcel, Lyos deferred his rationale, prioritizing the segregation of the imposters. Skepticism surrounded his intuitive approach, leading Sinchi to conclude that self-defense might solely rest upon their initiatives. Subsequently, confrontations ensued amongst the pairings. Lyos rationalized such outcomes as inevitable, regardless of his selections. He elaborated on shapeshifter as a term enveloping monsters capable of mimicry, possession, or actual transformation, suggesting these entities belong to such categories. 
Regardless, a monster's incapacity to genuinely prepare food implies that these entities must be illusions, as Marcel hypothesized, operated remotely. Given its tendency to target living beings, the creature likely falls into the carnivorous or omnivorous category, exhibiting too much caution and timidity to confront its prey directly. The environment's cold, dimness, and limited visibility suggest it thrives in such conditions, relying heavily on its senses or auditory capabilities, categorizing it as a beast. Laios concluded they were positioned downwind, with the adversary biding its time until they were weakened. Realizing the futility of blindly brandishing his weapon, he pondered his next move. Laios observed the unusual silence of his sword, Kinsuku, considering the lethal potential of the cold. He recollected the folklore of using garlic or rowan for protection, but recognized the situation required a more primal resolution. To reverse the predator-prey dynamic, Laios determined to adopt the role of the predator. In a bold strategy, Laios distanced himself from the ongoing conflicts with their doppelgangers and, assuming a position in the shadows, commenced barking towards the obscurity of the corridor. This unorthodox method left his companions astonished and intrigued. Drawing from a lifetime of companionship with dogs, Laios harnessed their taught survival tactics and the essence of challenging formidable adversaries. He aimed to convince the lurking beast of its newfound status as the prey, a tactic that successfully dispelled the illusions. Upon the beast's emergence, Laios maintained his ground, aware that in such confrontations, displaying fear spells defeat. Marcel's timely intervention with a spell incinerated the creature's head, prompting Chilchik's concerned inquiry regarding Laios's well-being and rationale behind not preemptively wielding his weapon. A reflection of Laios's deep immersion in his enacted role. Sinchi noted the incomplete state of their culinary endeavors, attributed to their illusory nature, necessitating a redo. Chilchik, acknowledging Laios's discerning judgment, sought clarity on the observations that guided his decision, to which Laios attributed their spatial positioning relative to the monsters. Initially, Lahio's suspicion was aroused by the Chilchuk who chose to sit on a wooden crate, a known hiding spot for mimics and tentacles, yet he displayed no wariness. Moreover, the counterfeit Sinchi's claim of collecting every egg he could find struck him as odd since the real Sinchi is known for his commitment to maintaining ecological balance. Such recklessness seemed uncharacteristic. Furthermore, the moment Marcel discarded the water post-boiling without a second thought, especially considering the risk of an undine, highlighted a level of carelessness that was unmissable. This oversight led him to consider her the genuine Marcel, much to her astonishment. Since she praised Lano's efforts, albeit acknowledging his earlier misjudgment, while Chilchuk hinted that his focus might have been misdirected. Laios elaborated that penetrating an illusion is inherently challenging, given its effectiveness in sustaining the creature. Marcel pinpointed the giveaway for the imposter Marcel was her reference to having consumed merman eggs and dryads, an event she was certain never transpired, despite our collective recollection of such meals. After resolving the deceptive predicament, the group settled into a dining experience. Senshi presented a dessert comprised of sweet dryad, marking their first indulgence in sweets for some duration, which Laios found delightfully tasty. Senshi then suggested brewing tea, realizing they still had some amidst our supplies. However, the sudden disappearance of the provisions bag, which was just moments ago within the vicinity, caught them off guard. Their attention was drawn to the rice scattered across the floor, leading Chilchuk to urge silence as they traced the grains. Upon inspecting the cell, nobody's inside. Yet, Turning around, they were confronted by a woman in black attire seizing Marcel, who then demanded them to lower their weapons and proposed a dialogue under the pretense of maintaining peace. Why Saro's ninja on the sixth floor, holding Marcel hostage? Laios was on the verge of grabbing his sword when the woman commanded everyone to step back five paces and lie face down on the ground, threatening their lives if they made even the slightest movement. Chilchik recognized her as one of Saro's followers. Laios wondered if she had been trailing them all along. The woman, with a stern gaze on Marcel, demanded she quickly undo the spell cast upon her. Marcel asked about the nature of the spell, to which the woman admitted ignorance, simply expecting Marcel to identify it by sight, given her proficiency with dark arts. Marcel corrected her, stating she practices ancient magic, and requested the woman indicate the spell's location. Upon loosening her scarf, the woman revealed two spells, one on her neck, 
the other covering her body. Lyos identified her as a beast kin, prompting Chilchuk to recall seeing one in the past and explain that beast kin are artificially created by merging the souls of a human and a beast through dark arts. This reflection caused Lyos to think of his sister, Farlin. Marcel promised to attempt the spell's removal. Upon examining the next spell, she observed it appeared to be written in an Eastern script. When Marcel inquired about the spell's nature, the woman informed her it was a curse, set to activate unless the caster touches it periodically. Marcel speculated whether Maizuru was the caster, questioning the activation time frame and consequences of failure. The woman, uncertain, urged Marcel to act swiftly to avoid dying alongside her, promising release only if the spell was dispelled, and cautioned against any deceit, threatening Marcel's life at any moment. Marcel observed the unique script, suggesting it might be derived from gnomic magic. She was confident in her ability to dispel it if that were the case. The woman addressed Chilchuk dismissively as a child and requested something to eat. Lyos and Sinchi exchanged a glance of consent, encouraging him to present their provisions to her. Upon inspecting the bag's contents, she discovered a hierogan and consumed it eagerly, revealing her hunger. Sinchi questioned when she last ate, cautioning her against eating too rapidly to avoid choking. However, she curtly told him to be silent and reminded him of her earlier order to remain still. As predicted by Sinchi, she choked on the hierogan, which he explained was essentially a compressed ball of powder. Sinchi offered to prepare something to alleviate her discomfort, but received a stern warning against feeding her a monster. He evaluated their remaining supplies, predominantly monsters, but chose mushrooms gathered near the dryads, which seemed to be sprouting leg-like growths. He commenced cooking with these mushrooms, utilizing Marcel's previously employed magic circle for heat, despite uncertainties about its functionality. Since she struggled without visible flames but proceeded to fry rice, butter, and garlic, followed by adding the mushrooms, seasoning, and water for simmering. Lacking vegetables, meat, or eggs, he feared the dish would be bland. After tasting the finished product, he was disheartened by the quality but resolved to not let them starve. He then added some cheese. Ultimately, he served a risotto made with mushrooms from the graveyard and orc cheese. Senshi presented the dish to the woman, who initially showed reluctance. However, the aroma enticed her to hastily devour the meal, and she even cleaned the bowl with her tongue afterward. Their observation of her poor table manners led to a request for seconds. Layo speculated that perhaps etiquette differs significantly in the East, although Chilchuk noted he had never observed Soro eating in such a manner, recalling Soro's impeccable dining posture. Chilchuk suggested that perhaps the woman's manners were a result of a poor upbringing. When Sinchi served her another portion of risotto, she began discarding the mushrooms with her spoon, an action that took everyone, especially Sinchi, by surprise. She expressed her dislike for mushrooms, prompting Marcel to comment on her selective eating habits. Chilchuk and Lyos looked on, curious about Sinchi's response to the rejection. Sinchi advised the woman on proper spoon etiquette, which she dismissively warned could provoke her to violence if he persisted. Undeterred, Sinchi again instructed her to correct her spoon handling and retrieve the discarded food, which only angered her further. Marcel intervened, cautioning against any movement during the spell dispelling process. It was then that a menacing monster appeared behind the woman. Sinchi tackled her to the ground just as the creature attacked. While holding her hand, Sinchi gently corrected her spoon technique, to which she argued in favor of her own method for ease. Sinchi acknowledged the discomfort in being forced to adapt to unfamiliar methods. As their discussion unfolded, the monster loomed behind Sinchi, prompting Lyos to draw his sword and strike, only to find his blade passing harmlessly through. This led to speculation about the monster's composition. Senshi observed the creature's weapon, a sujibiki knife, noting its specific use for slicing meat, highlighting its sharpness and fragility. He ominously predicted the outcome of mishandling such a delicate tool. Lagos quickly passed Senshi's pan to him, which he wielded as a shield against the creature's attack. Remarkably, the monster's knife failed to penetrate the pan, instead cracked upon impact. Senshi highlighted the importance of utilizing tools effectively noting that failing to do so could lead to disadvantageous situations. With adept use of the pan, he cleaved the monster in two and immobilized it against the wall. Lyos, seizing the lower portion of the creature, 
delivered a decisive kick to its upper segment, ensuring their victory. The ninja looked on in disbelief at the unfolding scene. Approaching the ninja, Senshi inquired about her well-being and offered apologies for any fright he may have caused. He took this moment to emphasize the significance of proper tool handling, suggesting she reflect on his advice. Marcel chimed in, advising against movement during the dispelling of her magic, warning of potential complications with more complex spells. Noticing her meal had cooled, Senshi offered to reheat it using the magic circle's heat. Curiosity peaked, Lyos questioned the ninja's reasons for tailing them. She revealed her quest to find a means to remove the curse afflicting her, a task complicated by her limited understanding of dark arts. Her search had been fruitless until encountering Marcel. Marcel corrected her, explaining that her focus on ancient magic involved harnessing energy from alternate dimensions. The ninja, however, accused Marcel of deception, convinced of her capability to reverse the curse based on past actions that involved creating a monstrous aberration. This revelation stunned the group. The ninja elaborated on their journey deeper into the dungeon to lift a curse from another member of their party, deducing that their knowledge could also be applied to her situation. She implored them to assist in expelling the animal spirit that possessed her, hopeful for their expertise in resolving her dilemma. Marcel offered her apologies, stating candidly that she was unable to assist the woman. She explained the complexity of the soul, likening it to an egg with the body serving as its shell. Damage to the body, she elaborated, doesn't necessarily result in the soul's escape due to a protective spell within the dungeon acting as a membrane. Marcel conveyed that she and Farlin were entwined in a predicament akin to two souls sharing a single egg, making their separation impossible. Chilchuk acknowledged that while they might have sensed this truth deep down, hearing it articulated so clearly was profoundly different. The woman's confusion led her to question their motivation for delving deeper into the dungeon. Lyos highlighted their inability to abandon Farlin in her current state, fearing she could either harm others or be harmed herself. He mentioned their desire to intervene before such incidents occurred. Another reason for their continued journey, he revealed, was the threat of arrest for practicing dark arts should they return to the surface, suspecting Soro would likely report them. This revelation disheartened the woman, who lamented her permanent state. Laios, however, expressed gratitude for their meeting, pointing out her normal communication and lack of a murderous impulse. This gave him hope that, similar to her, Farlin might regain her humanity if the dungeon's influence was removed. His appreciation for this newfound insight was evident as he comforted her. Since she, offering warm food, suggested their encounter was destined, encouraging a positive outlook. Marcel speculated that the dungeon lord, proficient in ancient magic, might possess the knowledge to separate souls. This led the woman to inquire whether they expect her to join their group, with Chilchuk noting her unlikely chances of solo survival on the surface. Upon asking if her name was Asabi and learning it was merely a nickname, she introduced herself as Azutsumi, urging them to remember her name. The scene then transitions. Upon slaying a dragon, Lyos found himself confronted by his father, who questioned the duration Lyos intended to live such a life, urging him to seek a legitimate livelihood. His father expressed disappointment, stating that his intention was never for Lyos to wander the world as a dragon slayer. His mother chimed in, emphasizing the urgency of providing them with grandchildren and beckoned him to return to their village. Despite Lyos' insistence on Farlin's need for him, his father dismissed the concern, questioning Lyos' ability to achieve significance in the world. He highlighted Lyos' past failures in adapting to military and academic settings, as well as his lack of talent in dungeon exploration. Another figure appeared, cautioning Lyos about the potential betrayal by comrades, as had happened during his gold-stripping endeavors, criticizing his judgment of character. Soro then confirmed the figure's warning, mocking Lyos' misconception of their friendship. Confused by his parents' presence after a decade of separation, Lyos questioned his current reality and purpose. The narrative then shifts to Marcel, visibly exhausted. Lyos suggested she rest while they kept watch, but she declined, claiming fatigue had not yet taken her. Despite her resistance, Lyos and Sinchi insisted on her need for rest. Soon, Marcel's quiet breathing escalated into distressed moans, signaling not merely a nightmare but the presence of a monster. Nightmares, as Lyos explained, are entities that exploit the sleeping by inducing terrifying dreams and feeding off the resultant emotional distress. 
They acknowledged the danger of allowing Marcel to remain ensnared by the nightmare, potentially leading to her weakening and demise. Chilchuk proposed awakening her, but Lyos warned against the psychological harm that could result from such an abrupt intervention. Recalling a previous incident where Soro was afflicted by a nightmare, Lyos mentioned Farland's intervention in Soro's dream as a rescue method. Despite Chilchuk's skepticism about Lyos' ability to navigate the dream without succumbing to nightmares himself, Lyos was adamant about notifying Marcel of her dreaming state. He suggested employing the dreamer as a pillow as an initial step towards entering her dream. Revisiting the scene where Lyos confronts illusions of his parents, he quickly realized he had been ensnared in his own dream, not Marcel's, which he initially set out to rescue her from. With this awareness, he summoned a powerful three-headed beast, reflecting on the mental challenges prevalent on the dungeon's sixth floor. Lyos then contemplated entering Marcel's dream, envisaging her beneath him and deciding to burrow through the dream's terrain. These with which he could alter his appearance in the dream highlighted its surreal nature. After tunneling through, Lyos experienced a sensation of falling, narrowly avoiding awakening. He found himself within a vast library, identifying it as Marcel's dream realm, which he found astonishing. Searching for Marcel, he encountered a younger version of her who urgently warned him of imminent danger. After introducing himself, he reassured Marcel that she was merely experiencing a dream and urged her to awaken. However, their conversation was interrupted as the environment began to quake. Marcel, visibly alarmed, insisted that they needed to flee because it was approaching. Curious, Lyos sought clarification on what it referred to. Marcel explained that it had consumed her father and Pippi, leading Lyos to understand she was ensnared in a nightmarish scenario of being pursued. Although common, such dreams are no less distressing, he acknowledged. Lyos recalled Farland's insight that nightmares prey on emotional scars, deep-seated fears, stressors, or traumatic experiences exacerbating these memories to torment the dreamer. The solution, then, was to shield these vulnerabilities. However, Farland had cautioned against attempting to emulate her approach, deeming it risky. Resolute, Lyos concluded that eliminating it from Marcel's dream was imperative for her peace of mind. Marcel expressed concern, to which Lyos responded with reassurance, dismissing the need for worry. Abruptly, an odd sea creature made its appearance, drawing closer as Marcel sought refuge behind Lyos. Questioned by Lyos about the creature's identity, Marcel admitted her ignorance. Lyos deduced that the creature might represent an exaggerated form of Marcel's fears. Despite the seeming impossibility of defeating it, he reasoned that if Marcel acknowledged the dream's nature, the creature would pose no threat. The environment shook, with Marcel despairing that no place was safe from the creature, nor could anyone withstand it. However, Lyos comforted her with a reassuring pat on the head, promising that together, they could find a solution to overcome the menace. This assurance led to an embrace from the young Marcel. Lyos pondered the nature of the creature. Its method of locomotion was slow, crawling movement, characterized by an abundance of tentacles, an insatiable hunger, and a repulsive appearance. Initially mistaking it for an insect due to its characteristics, Lyos eventually concluded that the creature was, in fact, a worm, distinguishing it not as a mere earthworm, but as a type of dragon, notable for its degraded limbs and eyes, which rendered its appearance caterpillar-like. The creature, known for its insatiable appetite, consumes any living thing it encounters. Lyos observed its vulnerability to fire and light, preparing himself to confront the massive worm. However, he found himself ensnared by its grasp. With quick thinking, Lyos hoisted Marceau and fled. He mentioned sustaining a minor injury, yet this brief contact grotesquely altered half of his face. This transformation heightened Marcel's fear, inadvertently strengthening the nightmare. Lyos detected the taste of poison and pondered the consequences of dying within another's dream, a thought that further alarmed Marcel. Nonetheless, Lyos realized that succumbing to fear or unease would only serve the nightmare's intentions. He chose instead to bolster Marcel's courage, reminding her of her innate magical abilities and her capacity to vanquish the foe independently. As their surroundings grew increasingly volatile, Lyos fretted over potentially having misspoken. Marcel disclosed that her previous attempts at magic transformation had unintended consequences, indirectly referencing Farland. She expressed remorse for employing a resurrection spell on Farland, 
attributing her fears not merely to the creature but to the concept of death itself. Despite the creature's resurgence, Lyos encouraged Marcel to confront it head-on, assuring her of revival even in the event of death within the dungeon, thanks to her resurrection magic that kept Farlin alive. By physically holding her back, Lyos compelled Marcel to face her fear directly. When the creature attempted to ingest Lyos, he wondered if he was its sole target. Marcel's intervention led Lyos to realize that what he perceived as poison was actually rapid aging. Gasping for breath, he acknowledged the anomaly, deducing the creature's non-living nature. Faced with Marcel's inquiry about his departure, Lyos simply expressed his need for a brief respite. Marcel, overcome with emotion, lamented that everyone, including her father, Pippi, and Farlin, had succumbed to being devoured by the menacing entity driving her to pursue magic fervently. She speculated whether her dedication to magic was the cause of Farland's current state, questioning her path forward. Lyos deduced that Marcel's father had died young, recalling her mother's words at his funeral about Marcel's unique journey and the inevitability of witnessing the departure of loved ones. Clarifying that Pippi was a bird, Lyos understood that Marcel's fear wasn't death itself, but the loss of those she held dear preceding her own demise. Lyos urged Marcel to calm down, explaining that their adversary grew stronger with her fear. Despite her doubts about her ability to confront the threat, Lyos bolstered her spirits. He pointed out the library surrounding them, a detail absent from his own dream, to demonstrate her diligent pursuit of knowledge and urged her to have faith in herself. Marcel, however, felt powerless without complete mastery of her magic, yearning for the mad sorcerer's grimoire for better spell control. Lyos encouraged her that anything was possible with enough determination. As the creature ensnared him, he inspired Marcel to face her fears and not to surrender. Marcel's determination led her to extract the grimoire from within the creature. With Lyos' final encouragement, she wielded the grimoire against the creature, resulting in an explosion that abruptly ended the nightmare, bringing Lyos back to reality. Chilchuk observed that both had been groaning in their sleep, but upon awakening, Lyos found himself unable to recall the dream. Marcel, awakening later, claimed to have experienced a rather pleasant dream, albeit without recollection of its contents. Lyos, investigating Marcel's pillow, discovered the sea creature-like nightmares responsible for their tormented dreams, hidden within. He suggested examining everyone else's pillows for similar threats, curiously inquiring Sinchi about their edibility, having long wondered about their taste. Sinchi confirmed they were edible. Observing the unfolding events from a distance, Izutsumi perceived a moment to discreetly formulate her departure, thereby avoiding participation in the consumption of monsters. Sinchi proposed a method to prepare the nightmares, suggesting their immersion in boiling water to purge the internal contaminants. He identified the nightmares as a shin, a term indicating their draconic nature. Following this initial step, Sinchi melted butter in a pan, gently laid the nightmares upon it, and subsequently introduced wine before sealing the pan with a lid. A final touch of soy sauce was added just before completion. Upon lifting the lid post-cooking, the group was unexpectedly greeted by a visual manifestation of Marcel's dream. Triggered by this vision, Marcel began to recollect details of her dream, notably an adventure in search of treasure accompanied by a dog. Chilchuk and Izutsumi made remarks about the dog's unkempt appearance and apparent lack of intelligence. Contrarily, Lyos's memory portrayed himself as a white wolf, differing from Marcel's canine companion. As they sampled the nightmares steamed in alcohol, Lyos mused on the positive outcome of their culinary experiment, content in the knowledge that his intervention might have contributed to Marcel experiencing a pleasant dream. As their adventure progressed, Marcel questioned if they were retracing their steps, to which Chilchuk confirmed they were. Izutsumi expressed impatience with their pace, urging them to hasten as they seemed to be lagging. Abruptly, the group stumbled into a familiar hall, the site of their initial encounter with a red dragon. Since she queried whether this location was part of their prior expedition, with Marcel affirming it had long been considered the dungeon's deepest accessible point until the discovery of a door hinting at further depths. This door, marked by a unique pattern, appeared to require magical activation. Their quest to replicate this pattern for the island's governor had previously been thwarted by the Red Dragon, forcing their retreat. They endeavored to locate their previous campsite and recover their equipment, 
Upon finding their belongings, it became evident that an intruder had rummaged through their possessions. While Marcel was relieved to find her bedroll intact, Lyos was similarly pleased about the condition of his underwear. Chilchuk, however, noted the absence of their food supplies, though the remainder of their gear was undisturbed. Marcel's emotional response to the warmth her bedroll would provide puzzled since she. Lyos proposed finding a suitable resting spot to organize their equipment. During this time, Izutsumi attempted to conceal an item in her pocket, but Chilchuk's keen observation led him to confront her. After seizing the item and identifying it as money, he admonished Marcel for bringing such into the dungeon and criticized Azutsumi's manners, suggesting a collar befit her behavior. Azutsumi, curious, inquired about Chilchuk's halfling heritage, noting her unfamiliarity with halflings until her dungeon arrival. She relayed a grim tale heard in the East about halflings being named for a punitive measure involving the removal of a foot for theft. Marcel intervened to quell the escalating argument between the two. Since she drew Marcel's attention to a fish that appeared to have been instantly frozen due to a drastic temperature drop, he inquired if there existed a spell capable of isolating just that section of ice. Marcel contemplated the possibility, proposing the creation of a magic circle as a solution. She suggested Lyos undertake the task, offering to guide him through the process of drawing one. Prior to beginning, she assessed Lyos' recent experiences with mana sickness, to which he reported an improvement in stability but noted an increase in hallucinatory experiences. As Marcel instructed Lyos, since she noted the type of fish, familiar from his catches on the fourth level, indicating water from above had frozen here, bringing various elements down with it. Once the circle was completed, Marcel evaluated Lyos' condition. He confessed to feeling slightly fatigued. Marcel then activated the circle, envisioning water channeling into the etched symbols. The activation, however, unexpectedly caused the ground to quake and an ice golem to emerge, shaking the vicinity and jeopardizing the stalactites above. Chilchuk alerted Marcel and Lyos to the impending danger from falling icicles. With limited time to react, Lyos shielded Marcel, taking the brunt of the icicle impact himself. As the ice golem rampaged, Izutsumi engaged it, attempting to halt its advance, but their efforts resulted in Lyos and Marcel being flung to the ground. Izutsumi sought advice on defeating the golem, to which Chilchuk advised targeting its core. However, Izutsumi's initial attempts proved futile, prompting a desperate search for the core's location amidst the golem's chaotic movements. Chilchuk pondered the golem's composition, suggesting Izutsumi distract it to afford him time to deduce the core's location due to the complexity of its integrated elements. Izutsumi, frustrated with being tasked with what she perceived as futile actions, feared Chilchuk might be complicating her role intentionally. The ice golem attempted to crush Azutsumi with its hands, but her quick reflexes and animal instincts allowed her to evade, jumping and rolling away from danger. However, she found herself sinking into the snow and was subsequently launched into the air by the golem's kick, ending up buried. Chilchuk observed the golem momentarily halting its pursuit. Izutsumi resurfaced from the snow, persisting in her efforts to divert the golem's focus through her agile maneuvers. Inquiring about Chilchuk's readiness, Izutsumi questioned the duration she must continue her diversionary tactics. Acknowledging her efforts, Chilchuk took aim with his arrow and launched it toward the golem, satisfied with his precise shot. Despite the arrow's failure to penetrate the golem, causing Izutsumi's frustration, Chilchuk urged her to examine the impact site more closely. He confessed his proficiency with ranged weapons did not guarantee damage and advised against relying on him for combat strategies, leaving the remainder of the task to her. Azutsumi, taken aback by this revelation, engaged the golem once more, utilizing Chilchuk's arrow to target the specific spot he had hit. Her action induced the golem to begin fracturing, ultimately disintegrating into pieces. Meanwhile, Chilchuk assisted Senshi out of the snow while Izutsumi remarked on her unique mobility amidst the group's struggle with the cold. Shivering from the freezing temperatures, the group found it challenging to withstand the cold. Marcel, ensuring everyone's safety, requested a brief pause to allow for warming. She cautioned them about the potent heat emitted by the magic circle, advising against too close an approach to avoid burns. Marcel suggested they remove their wet clothing to facilitate drying, extending the offer to Izutsumi as well. She attempted to shield their privacy with her bedroll, 
But Izutsumi declined the gesture, stating her beast skin would likely not garner any interest. Despite this, Marcel quickly enveloped her with the bedroll, emphasizing the importance of staying warm to avoid catching a cold. Curiosity peaked, Laios attempted to sneak a peek at Izutsumi, which prompted Sinchi to shield his eyes. As the temperature in the area increased slightly, Sinchi proposed making something warm to eat. He retrieved the frozen fish, intending to thaw it using the magic circle's warmth, but accidentally placed it too close. Marcel observed the surroundings transforming into a sauna-like environment and seized the moment to suggest a bath, considering it had been some time since their last opportunity to cleanse themselves. The group used this chance for a quick wash, and Chilchuk expressed surprise at seeing Sinchi without his helmet. Laios, intrigued, inquired why he was blindfolded. The group embarked on meal preparation, with Sinchi delegating the task of cleaning and gutting the fish to Chilchik, who was also instructed to reserve the head and bones for broth. Marcel expressed concern about the potential for the fish's odor to linger on them. Sinchi proceeded to finally slice mushrooms and nightmares, followed by simmering shapeshifter meat and removing any scum that surfaced. Harpy eggs were then incorporated, and the earlier prepared broth was mixed with these ingredients. Meanwhile, Marcel assisted Azutsumi with her cleanup. Upon completing the cooking process, Sinchi served the mixture into cups, which he then placed in a pot alongside fragments of the ice golem, reheating the concoction over a flame. The result was a dish dubbed Ice Golem Chawan Mushi and cooked fish that was inside the ice golem. As Sinchi was about to summon everyone to eat, Azutsumi began to indulge in the meal. Sinchi intervened, emphasizing the importance of waiting for the entire group to gather before starting. Izutsumi argued her right to eat first, citing her pivotal role in defeating the adversary. Sinchi, however, insisted on the principle of commencing the meal together and sent Chilchuk to summon Laios. Chilchuk discovered Laios sprawled in the snow, bewildered by his actions. With the group reunited, they began their meal, even though Laios remained blindfolded. Marcel remarked on the pudding-like consistency of the dish, while Laios found it challenging to navigate his meal without sight. Izutsumi expressed frustration over the perceived delay. Chilchuk presented Izutsumi with a repaired bag, explaining he had mended one of the torn bags for her use. He also offered an apology for previously referring to her derogatorily as a beast, confessing his occasional tendency towards harsh comments. Chilchuk reflected on the dynamics of working within a newly formed group, acknowledging the initial discomfort and frustration it might bring. He suggested that, over time, the benefits of collaboration become apparent, as team members can offer support in areas where others may lack. Izutsumi contemplated Chilchuk's words, holding the mended bag thoughtfully. In the meantime, Sinchi took on the task of feeding Laios, who was still hindered by his blindfold. The group collectively expressed their appreciation for the meal, embracing the shared experience despite the earlier tensions and challenges. As they prepared to don new attire, the men waited outside, growing impatient while Marcel and Izutsumi changed. Upon their emergence, Marcel apologized for the delay and introduced Izutsumi's new outfit, originally belonging to Namari, as a perfect match, despite Izutsumi's complaints about its restrictiveness. Chilchuk, feeling the chill from waiting, expressed his discomfort, to which Marcel extended her apologies. The group then readied to continue their adventure, but Sinchi interjected, presenting simmered mandrakes and sweet sauce as a convenient snack for their journey. The offering, however, was met with dissatisfaction from the women, with Azutsumi particularly resistant, leading to an altercation with Laios that resulted in him getting scratched. The sight of Laios bleeding shocked Marcel, while Chilchuk lamented the group's preoccupation with trivial conflicts amidst greater concerns. Marcel advised Laios to respect Azutsumi's dietary choices, assuring him that she would eat when necessary, and attended to his injury. Laios's inquiry into Izutsumi's refusal to eat monsters led to her expressing fears of contracting a disease and transforming into a monster herself. Laios whimsically commented on the simplicity of such a transformation process. Marcel reflected on the innate revulsion towards consuming monsters, a sentiment she acknowledged as common, including among themselves, attributing it to the ingestion of something perceived as unclean. She elaborated on the distinctions between monsters and animals noting monsters reliance on mana for energy and their heightened aggression surpassing survival instincts. 
the toxicity of concentrated mana to animals, and the potential risk of monsters preying on humans were highlighted as significant concerns, underscoring the complexity and apprehension surrounding the consumption of monster flesh. Marcel elaborated on the emergence of new diseases through close interactions between humans and other living entities, suggesting that the hesitation to consume certain foods based on a gut feeling of wrongness is not as unfounded as one might presume. She then inquired into Azutsumi's past experiences with undesirable meals. Azutsumi reminisced about such instances, recalling her practice of passing disliked items to Tade, who gladly accepted them. Nonetheless, she misrepresented her history to Marcel, claiming she had never encountered such situations. Despite the relentless blizzard on the sixth floor, the group pressed on. Laios, acknowledging the growing hunger among them, suggested establishing a camp in the current location. He took inventory of their remaining provisions, which included nightmares, mandrakes, eggs, and mushrooms, but noted the absence of fish and rice. Azutsumi, querying the availability of more palatable options, expressed skepticism and accused Laios of withholding food. Laios countered, emphasizing the necessity of adapting to the dungeon's food sources, which varied widely throughout their travels. He reasoned that acclimatization to consuming monsters would be beneficial, dismissing the notion that such a diet could cause one to morph into a monster. He rhetorically questioned if consuming sheep, pigs, or even eyeballs could lead to physical transformations, underscoring the complexity of diet and nutrition beyond simple cause and effect. Izutsumi, growing irritated with the discussion, abruptly silenced Laios and directed attention to a peculiar sight, a sheep that had metamorphosed into a tree. Laios identified it as a baromets. Frustrated by their encounter with Abaramets at such a critical moment, Laios clarified that the plant-like creature was inherently harmless, originating as a plant. Azutsumi, having grown tired of Laios' explanations, decided to pursue the sheep-like Baramets. Marcel advised Laios to allow Azutsumi her autonomy, expressing curiosity about the nature of it. Laios elaborated on the Baramets' benign nature, nourished by mana, yet attracting carnivores due to its appeal as prey cautioning against approaching it without vigilance. Despite Laio's warning, Izutsumi's disdain for his advice was evident. She then detected a scent, prompting Laios to urge her to expedite her retrieval of the sheep due to the looming danger. This warning materialized as wolves approached, leading Laios and Chilchuk to brace for combat. Marcel, seeking her staff, noticed Izutsumi retreating into a cave, questioning her departure. Izutsumi voiced her aversion to dogs for their odor, noise, and persistence, opting to leave the confrontation to the others as per Chilchuk's earlier sentiment on leveraging group dynamics. Marcel refuted Izutsumi's interpretation, explaining her absence in the Golem fight was not out of reluctance but strategy. Concerned for the group's welfare, Marcel insisted on rejoining them, despite Izutsumi's reluctance to engage with the hostile situation. Izutsumi discerned the aroma of fire carried by the wind, suggesting that by tracing its source, they would circle back to their initial location. As they navigated what seemed to be a labyrinthine path, the scent grew more pronounced to the right, a direction Izutsumi favored despite Marcel's hesitations about its accuracy. Unfazed, Izutsumi encouraged Marcel to choose her own route, emphasizing the need for Marcel to assert herself and make independent decisions. She critiqued Marcel for her apparent contradiction. Despite her vocal aversion to consuming monsters, she partook in eating them nonetheless, a behavior Azutsumi found perplexing, leaving Marcel without a response. The imminent threat of pursuing wolves prompted Marcel to propose a standoff. She considered deploying explosive magic, but was hindered by the absence of her staff and the peril posed by the cramped surroundings. Azutsumi, however, advocated for evasion, aiming to outpace and elude their pursuers, leaving Marcel momentarily taken aback. Amidst their flight, Izutsumi was beset by recollections of her own group. She remembered being reprimanded by Maizuru for shirking her responsibility of clearing snow from the roof and imposing the task on Tade, who subsequently suffered a fall. Maizuru's admonition highlighted the expectation of gratitude for the group's acceptance of Izutsumi, who responded with nonchalance. Further, Azutsumi's encounter with her provoked questions about her motivations for undertaking unrequested tasks, to which Azutsumi dismissively labeled her actions as foolish. Returning to the moment, Azutsumi struggled to recall Tade's response and, failing to do so, resumed her exploration. 
Suddenly, a wolf bit into her right arm. A mistake Izutsumi attributed to not noticing the wind's altered course following an explosion. The wolf aimed to rip her arm off, but Marcel intervened with a surprise magical assault, resulting in a significant explosion that forced the wolf to release Izutsumi. Marcel, relieved at the outcome, watched as Izutsumi retaliated fiercely against the wolf, biting and then stabbing it in the neck. Marcel, concerned, approached Izutsumi to inquire about her condition and, fearing her arm was broken, suggested rejoining the rest of their group. Responding to Azutsumi's earlier question regarding her willingness to consume monsters, Marcel shared her contemplations. She acknowledged having several objectives, such as saving a friend, deepening her understanding of magic, and facing unwelcome challenges. These encounters, while individually minor, are part of her broader journey towards her goals. Marcel admitted that while some obstacles could be circumvented without derailing her mission, avoiding every displeasure could lead her astray from her initial path mirroring their current predicament. Marcel then questioned Azutsumi's reasons for joining their group, to which Azutsumi mentioned the potential of having her curse lifted upon meeting the mad sorcerer. Marcel affirmed this possibility, highlighting the need for readiness to embrace necessary detours along their journey. Lyos expressed his relief upon their return, safe and sound. Marcel checked on everyone's condition, with Chilchuk revealing that Lyos had managed to intimidate the wolves, resolving the situation smoothly, largely because many of the wolves had pursued Marcel. Noting Izutsumi's injury, Marcel prepared to cast a healing spell to mend the broken arm, enlisting Lyoza's assistance for the procedure. She praised Izutsumi for her bravery, promising that the discomfort would soon subside, despite Izutsumi's claim that the spell itself was more painful. Lyoza mentioned his intention to retrieve the baromets, but discovered the wolves had ran off with the fully grown one leaving only an immature fruit behind. When Sinchi cut it open, they found it encased a sheep within a vegetable, intriguing Izutsumi and causing concern for Marcel. Sinchi proceeded to prepare the baromets, seasoning and cooking the ribs before steaming them with wine. He then boiled the vegetable rind, peeled, and diced it, simmering it with garlic to create a sauce for the meat, resulting in a dish dubbed baromets ballot. Sinchi served Izutsumi her portion, which she scrutinized for unfamiliar ingredients, identifying the baromet's rind and sprouts. She voiced a preference for simply roasted meat but decided to taste the dish. Meanwhile, Lyos clarified to Marcel that despite its outward appearance, a baromet's does not truly resemble a sheep, explaining its crab-like taste. Izutsumi found the dish irresistibly delicious, much to her own surprise. Reflecting on her past dialogue with Tade, Izutsumi recalled questioning her about undertaking tasks unrequested. Tate confessed her desire to prove herself indispensable, highlighting the comforts of their home, including regular meals, warm futons, and the luxury of baths as motivations to secure her place among them. Tate emphasized the importance of contributing through chores to enhance her standing within the group. Tate called her Asabi and cautioned her against allowing aversions to cloud her appreciation of their collective life mentioning Maizuru's candy rewards as a bonus. In the present, Izutsumi acknowledged the wisdom in Tate's perspective, recognizing that the effort sometimes yields unexpectedly pleasant outcomes. The group lauded Izutsumi for her willingness to experiment with the new dish, attributing her adventurous taste to necessity rather than choice. She staunchly refused to entertain the idea of consuming disliked vegetables or monsters in the future, prompting Sinchi to counter that judgment should be reserved until after tasting. Noticing Marcel's hesitance to eat, Izutsumi pointed out the inconsistency between her advice and actions, leading Marcel to ruefully admit to inadvertently limiting her own options. Soro and Cabru's groups left Lyoza's party, making their way back to the surface. Upon their arrival, Mikbel expressed his joy at returning, while Maizuru remarked on the incomparable quality of the surface air. Mikbel, uncertain of the time of day, was cautioned by home against tampering with the window to avoid disrupting the transportation spell. Soro mentioned his plan to report to the island's governor the following day, requesting Cabru's presence to corroborate his account. Cabru queried if the report would encompass everything, but Soro saw no necessity in divulging details about Lyos and his companions, focusing instead on preventing any further harm by Farlin. Cabro suggested postponing this conversation until the next day, advising Soro to rest. Mikbel and Kuro's attention was drawn to a large ship, 
speculating about the wealth of its passengers. Cabra, alarmed upon viewing the ship, recognized the urgency of their situation. Soro inquired about the ship, which Cabru identified as belonging to the Western Elves, known colloquially as Canaries. Their arrival signified a dungeon's danger level had escalated beyond a certain threshold, with their mandate being to assess and seize control of such dungeons. Cabru shared rumors of the Canaries exerting pressure on the governor, concluding that their direct intervention suggested a more assertive approach. Regrettably, Cabra highlighted the governor's lack of prowess in negotiation, suggesting that the elves' aggressive approach might precipitate an immediate intervention, potentially leading to Farland's capture and Lyos's party's apprehension. Soro expressed doubt over the legality of such actions within human territories. Cabru explained that elves and dwarves, perceiving races with ephemeral lifespans and brief histories as naive, liken their intervention to disarming a child. The presence of the white ship piqued the villagers' curiosity, with some describing it as sinister, others circulating rumors of gruesome punishments meted out by its crew, and some discussing its role in thwarting escape attempts from the island. Cabru's extensive knowledge prompted Soro to question his intentions, to which Cabru expressed his desire to prevent further casualties within the dungeon. Soro mentioned the elves' involvement might be the most prudent course of action. Cabra's evident concern led Soro to suspect there was more behind his disapproval of the elves' methods. The conversation shifted when Soro's bell, given to Laios, persistently rang, inadvertently serving as a tracker for Laios' movements. Soro's attempt to discard the bell was thwarted by Cabra. During their stroll on the island, Naomari approached Soro, inquiring about Farlin. Soro confirmed that Laios and his companions remained resolute in their quest. Cabro interjected their intention to meet with the island's governor. Namari disclosed that such a meeting was improbable due to the arrival of influential figures who had been in closed-door discussions for hours. Cabro's concern grew upon learning of the elves' presence inside, inquiring about other attendees. Namari mentioned an elderly gnome advisor's participation, noting that additional arrivals were denied entry. Cabra's urgency to gain access despite the likelihood of their tardiness underscored the situation's gravity. Soro queried about potential issues with entering the ongoing meeting, but Cabra highlighted the finality of relinquishing the dungeon to the elves, fearing the loss of any future influence or knowledge about its fate. He recounted a personal tragedy where his hometown, prosperous because of a nearby dungeon, was overwhelmed by monsters, leading to significant loss, including his family. Cabra, raised by a devoted single mother, found the lack of explanations for their deaths and the disaster unbearable, fueling his determination to prevent such events from recurring. He criticized the power imbalance among races as unhealthy. Defying the ongoing session's privacy, Cabru barged into the meeting room, apologizing for the intrusion but insisting on delivering a report to the governor. An elf requested his departure due to their engagement in urgent discussions. Nevertheless, Cabru persisted, outlining his recent dungeon exploration and the discovery of a human transformed into a monster, identified by the elves as a chimera, indicating the dungeon's rapid and alarming evolution. The revelation prompted immediate action from the elves, underscoring the urgency of their mission and the need for landing permissions. The gnome advisor, infuriated, resisted being diminished to an old man by the elves. Despite the gnome's protests, the governor, Swayed by the situation's gravity and the elf's flattering assessment of his flexibility and wisdom, seemed inclined to authorize the elf's request. The gnome opposed the decision, marking a contentious moment in the negotiation. Soro questioned if Cabra's actions had inadvertently compounded their predicament. Cabra admitted to himself that if he possessed the capability to subdue the dungeon single-handedly, they would not face such dilemmas. However, he acknowledged his aversion to even the sight or touch of monsters, which led him to explore ways he could bolster other adventurers who demonstrated genuine prowess. Unfortunately, he found that most were self-serving, and a significant number lacked merit. He observed that treasure seekers rarely considered the broader implications of their actions on humanity's future. Rumors about the Thornton siblings caught his attention, with their upbringing and altruistic nature distinguishing them in a realm where selfish motivations prevailed. Cabru noted their uncanny instincts and indifference towards personal gain, which marked them as outliers. Delving deeper, he found Laios's case particularly perplexing. Despite not being the strongest, Laios and his group had ventured far into the dungeon. 
Cabrillo was intrigued by Lyoza's generosity towards those ensnared in dubious gossip and his eclectic circle of associates. This led to the realization that Lyoza could significantly impact the island's destiny, though Cabrillo remained uncertain whether this influence would be beneficial or detrimental. Ultimately, Cabrillo's encounter with Lyoza confirmed his theories. Lyoza's preoccupation with monsters precludes any consideration for the island's future, a responsibility Cabrillo believes should not fall to him. Despite this, Cabrillo acknowledges that Lyoza is currently the individual nearest to the dungeon's heart, representing a unique opportunity that cannot be squandered. Cabrillo resolves to prevent the elves from disrupting Lyoza's advancement within the dungeon, choosing to address any personal qualms with him later. As the elves persist in urging the governor to endorse their proposal with his official seal, Cabro intervenes, imploring them to pause. He explains that the dungeon's architecture, ecosystem, and resident species are undergoing significant transformations, contributing to its instability. One elf acknowledges this characteristic of maturing dungeons, emphasizing the urgency of arresting its development. However, Cabrou likens the dungeon's growth to that of a living being, suggesting it is currently in a critical phase akin to a young organism's need for nourishment, leaving the elves puzzled by his analogy. Cabrou elaborated on the devastation of his childhood village, Ataya, by a dungeon 15 years prior, a revelation that startled the elves, recognizing him as the survivor they had heard about. Confirming he was the individual rescued and cared for by the vice commander, Cabrou disclosed his aspiration to become an adventurer, despite racial hurdles, motivated by a desire to avert the recurrence of such tragedies. The elves, moved by his determination, shifted to a more congenial demeanor, inquiring about his well-being and encouraging him to maintain a positive outlook. They invited him to elaborate on his earlier mention of the dungeon's nutrition. Cabrou detailed the immediate collapse of the Ataya dungeon due to concentrated efforts against it, which, while effective, resulted in significant casualties among both the village's defenders and inhabitants. The deceased morphed into monsters, exacerbating the horror as they preyed on survivors, with many soldiers ambushed and slain. He warned that a large-scale assault on the dungeon could mirror the catastrophe experienced by Ataya, underscoring the potential for history to repeat itself if aggressive actions were pursued without heed to past outcomes. Cabro suggested isolating the dungeon to prevent it from receiving further nourishment, asserting that their primary mission was not merely to engage it in battle. The elf leader inquired about the presence of individuals within the dungeon, to which Cabro confirmed that many were concentrated on the first floor. He proposed evacuating them in smaller groups, emphasizing the collective responsibility in addressing the situation. Cabro offered to coordinate the evacuation with the help of known allies entrusting the task to his leadership. After internal discussions, the elves decided to support Cabrou's plan, with Soro being asked to assist. The elf leader, suspecting Cabrou's ulterior motives, declared their intention to accompany him. The governor assured that his forces would intervene if necessary. Meanwhile, on the sixth floor, Sinchi engaged in culinary preparations, incorporating an egg into boiling water. He utilized this moment to draw a parallel between Marcel's analogy of souls and eggs, pondering the distinction between souls intermingling and the diverse outcomes of cooking eggs. Marcel dismissed the comparison as non-entertainment, prompting Sinchi to express admiration for her insightful analogy, highlighting the egg's unique characteristics, such as differential coagulation temperatures, and its functions in culinary applications. He particularly noted the egg's emulsifying properties, likening it to the blending of oil and water under specific conditions. He then started preparing an emulsion using egg yolk and melted butter in a bain-marie. Reflecting on Sinchi's explanation, Marcel pondered the accuracy of his culinary metaphor. Concurrently, Sinchi requested Lyos to retrieve some bread, which he then sliced and garnished with a poached egg and additional ingredients, topping it off with sauce and delicately piercing the egg. This creation, dubbed Soulful Eggs Benedict, was ready to be enjoyed. Lajos, uncertain of the proper dining etiquette for this dish, was advised by Sinchi to employ a fork and knife, using the bread to scoop the yolk and sauce. Upon tasting, Lajos affirmed its delightful flavor, as anticipated. Azatsumi, meanwhile, appeared preoccupied, her attention seemingly drawn to vacant spaces, which unnerved Chilchuk. He urged her to cease her restless observations, 
to which she responded with an admission of sensing an unseen presence, stirring surprise among the group. Laios, alarmed by her assertion, wondered aloud about his own experiences with apparent hallucinations, attributing them to his past struggles with mana sickness. He revealed to Marcel that such visions and auditory hallucinations had persisted, confessing his silence on the matter was due to Chilchuk's immediate dismissal of his symptoms as mental delusion. Lano shared that an entity has been communicating with him throughout the day. Initially, he struggled to comprehend its messages, but over time, his ability to see and hear the entity improved. He confessed finding the experience unnerving and had thus far feigned ignorance of its presence, a tactic that seemed to displease the figure. Laios expressed relief upon discovering that Izutsumi could perceive the entity as well, validating his experiences weren't mere hallucinations. Marcel questioned the entity's malevolence, to which Laios, after interacting with it, relayed that the figure felt misunderstood and maligned. Laios informed his companions that the spirit claimed credit for rescuing them from a sorcerer, leading them to recall an incident involving animate hands on a wall and prompted him to express their gratitude. The spirit then mentioned its desire to introduce them to someone else. Debating the prudence of following the entity's lead, they consented when Layo signaled his approval. This decision was swiftly followed by the manifestation of numerous hands before Layo's, startling the entire group. These hands unexpectedly transported to a new location. Senshi, disoriented by the abrupt transition, became nauseous. Layo's cautioned the group about the perils of resting by the roadside, just as a unicorn-drawn cart approached. The driver, puzzled by their origin, speculated they had arrived from beyond the village. Laios corrected him, stating their journey began in the dungeon. Realizing this, the driver offered him his hat and invited them aboard. The women took seats in the cart, while the men proceeded on foot. Upon arrival in a village inhabited by various monsters, Laios remarked on their tame behavior. The driver clarified this was by command, cautioning that the directive did not extend to outsiders like them and advised maintaining physical contact with an item from the village for safety. Izutsumi dozed off on Marcel's lap, leading Marcel to ponder if teleportation sickness was to blame. Laios pointed out a distant castle, identified by the driver as their entry point, credited to the spirit's guidance. Confirming their residence in the vicinity, the driver suggested seeking answers from their intended contact, admitting his limited knowledge of their selection. Laios's intrigue was piqued by the driver's reference to them as chosen, sparking curiosity about the implications of such a designation. Upon halting the cart, the driver promptly sought out the village lord, only to learn from a woman that he was away attending to worship. A boy's identification of the group as them surprised her. They were encouraged to relax and enjoy the village's hospitality while awaiting the lord's return. The villagers, visibly enthusiastic, gathered around them, pondering entertainment options due to the village's limited activities. Marcel questioned if the villagers were all inhabitants of the Golden Castle, noting their ordinary appearance, while Sinchi observed the absence of any elderly individuals among them. Laios expressed an interest in visiting the area where monsters were reared, and Sinchi showed a keenness to inspect the fields they had passed earlier. The villagers, pleased with their simple requests, eagerly agreed to facilitate their exploration. Choosing to remain with Izutsumi, Marcel opted out of the excursion. The woman then invited the rest of the party inside to wait. Laios's encounter with a female minotaur, used by the villagers in lieu of dairy cows, piqued his curiosity. When questioned about the preference for monster livestock, a boy explained the difficulty of obtaining regular livestock in their location. Laios was delighted by the opportunity to observe and interact with the various monsters populating the village. Senshi took the opportunity to inspect the village's fields and crops, expressing admiration for their meticulous cultivation. However, he noted the unusually large size of the produce, a detail the villager acknowledged, admitting much of it goes unused. Despite this, the act of farming provided a sense of purpose and a semblance of normal life akin to that on the surface. The villager mentioned that occasionally, the surplus is offered to orcs. Offering some vegetables to Senshi, the villager highlighted their effort to maintain a facade of surface life. Back in the room, Marcel expressed concern for Azutsumi, checking for signs of fever, but found her seemingly in good health. Female villagers then approached Marcel, inviting her to participate in a dress-fitting session. 
They explained that taking turns wearing the dresses they crafted had become monotonous due to the limited variety of models. Eager to see Marcel in their creations, they deliberated on the perfect color to complement her, cautioning that their fashion sense might appear outdated. Nevertheless, Marcel consented to try on the dresses, intrigued by the gesture. Marcel showcased the villagers' handmade dresses, pondering how centuries of isolation could diverge fashion trends significantly from those of the outside world. Meanwhile, Chilchuck enjoyed some locally produced alcohol at the bar, appreciating its quality despite his usual discernment. The bartender was pleased, mentioning that the orcs also favored his recent brews, implying its commendable taste. Chilchuck's curiosity about wine production led to the revelation that, although a newer endeavor compared to their centuries-old ale brewing tradition, it presented its own set of challenges. Astonished by the village's long-standing brewing history, Chilchuck learned that the bartender was the founding brewer, having started the establishment at 600 years old. Lyos burst in, exhilarated by his experience milking a minotaur, and marveled at the anatomical similarity to cows. Sinchi, joining the conversation, highlighted the successful integration of monster agriculture, particularly praising their extensive dried garden and inventive use of monster parts, such as a cup crafted from a fong, which unsettled Chilchuck. Laios, caught up in the excitement, suddenly recalled Marcel and Azutsumi, learning they were being attended to in another room. Upon their return, both Marcel and Azutsumi appeared in the dresses provided by the villagers, inciting laughter from Chilchuck. Marcel shared her inability to decline the villagers' request, choosing one of the more understated designs, as she affectionately positioned herself on Marcel's lap, warding off Laios. Marcel observed the numerous protective spells cast throughout the village, speculating they might be affecting Azutsumi in some way. Chilchuk wondered if Azutsumi's half-monster heritage was related to the phenomenon. Marcel expressed intrigue over a barrier capable of mitigating a monster's inherent aggression, admitting her unfamiliarity with the mechanism due to the numerous unfamiliar glyphs and lamenting the restrictions placed on her academic field. She admired the village's charm, musing that under different circumstances, she would enjoy a prolonged stay. This sentiment was echoed by Laios, both captivated by the village's allure. Their reflections were interrupted by a woman who expressed gratitude for their patience and announced the preparation of a meal for them. She invited them to dress comfortably before leading them to the dining area. There, they were greeted by a man who expressed his anticipation for their arrival. He revealed himself as Yado, the descendant of Durgal, a name that might resonate with them. Laios expressed curiosity upon hearing the name Durgal. Yado then invited them to sit, indicating they were about to engage in an extensive dialogue about the reasons behind their summoning. As the servants prepared the dining area, women presented a variety of dishes, including vegetables and jelly, blade fish loaf, beef ribs, and a potato and rabbit soup. Marcel's inquiry about the presence of meat was met with confirmation that minotaur meat had been included as requested, eliciting mixed reactions from the group. Laios questioned whether the consumption of monsters was a common practice among the villagers. Yato clarified that while some residents partake, most do not eat at all, explaining their diminished taste senses and lack of hunger, which he attributed to a curse of immortality inflicted by the mad sorcerer. Yato admitted his own understanding of the curse's purpose was limited, noting the sorcerer's long-standing irrational behavior and reluctance to engage in logical discourse. Yato encouraged them to indulge in the meal, explaining that although he lacks an appetite, witnessing others enjoy food brings him satisfaction. Marcel felt uncomfortable with the situation, recognizing the difficulty in conveying their reluctance to partake in the meal offered by their host. Yato recounted how his grandfather perpetually held himself accountable for the mad sorcerer's venture into dark magic, embarking on a quest to the surface world seeking assistance. He then queried the group about the legends the surface dwellers might recount regarding his grandfather, Durgal. Marcel relayed that, according to what she knew, Durgal emerged abruptly one day in the village's subterranean cemetery, proclaiming himself the ruler of a vanished realm and declaring that his entire kingdom would be bequeathed to whoever vanquished the mad sorcerer, after which he disintegrated into dust. Yato expressed a semblance of relief learning that his grandfather had been liberated from his ordeal. He elaborated on how many from the village attempted to flee the curse, yet none succeeded. Their efforts resulted merely in the loss of their corporeal forms. 
Those who lost their physical essence transformed into spirits, gradually eroding their self-awareness, becoming incapable of returning. Yato was convinced they had encountered such spirits, a point Lyos affirmed. Marcel's curiosity about their summoning led Yato to reveal a prophecy. The wielder of a winged blade shall be the one to defeat the mad sorcerer and set them free. Intrigued by the reference to wings, they examined Lyos' sword, which unexpectedly manifested a lion's head, puzzling Lyos. Yato rejoiced at the sight of Lyos with the prophesied winged sword. Yato explained that the winged lion serves as the guardian spirit of their nation, currently confined within the dungeon's darkest recesses by the mad sorcerer. Despite its captivity, the lion continues to prophesy through dreams and offer guidance. One such prophecy propelled his grandfather's expedition to the surface. Yato elaborated that the prophecy foretold the wielder of the winged blade as the destined vanquisher of the mad sorcerer and the future monarch of their land. Marcel, taken aback, protested that they had mistaken Laios for someone else, explaining his acquisition of the sword was mere happenstance. Yato, however, was convinced that fate, not coincidence, led Laios to them and implored him to vow to defeat the sorcerer and liberate them. Amidst Laios's bewilderment, his companion's perplexity, and the villagers' anticipation, Laios requested time to deliberate. Retreating to their quarters, Chilchuk advised Laios against instilling false hope if his intentions were to ultimately depart. Laios felt an outright denial was beyond him, puzzled over his sword's transformation. His anxiety had rendered him unable to appreciate the meal's flavors, a detail Marcel and Chilchuk found puzzling given his request for minotaur meat. Sinchi, reflecting on the village's culinary efforts, speculated their lack of necessity for food might explain the meal's lack of taste. He pondered the purpose of maintaining agricultural practices and utensils over centuries, concluding they preserved these aspects of living to maintain their sanity. Since she recalled Laios's past encouragement to the Orc chieftain, though Laios struggled to remember the specifics. Since she suggested he just sleep on it. Marcel, seeking companionship due to Azutsumi's peculiar behavior, requested to stay with them, despite Chilchuk's insistence she use her assigned quarters. Faced with the weight of potential kingship, Laios contemplated his choices, his grip tightening on the sword. Upon waking, Laios was greeted by a delightful aroma. Observing that his companions were still asleep, with the exception of Sinchi, he went in search of him and found him engaged in cooking alongside Yato. Sinchi was demonstrating his skill in flipping pancakes, much to Yato's delight. Sinchi acknowledged Laios's presence, and Yato offered a cheerful morning greeting. Laios questioned if they were preparing breakfast, to which Sinchi confirmed the task had just been completed. Yato complimented Sinchi's culinary prowess, a sentiment Laios echoed. The breakfast spread, featuring pancakes, soup, and sausages, was then ready to be served, prompting them to rouse the others for the meal. As they savored the breakfast, they encouraged Yato to sample some of the dishes, though he initially hesitated. Sinchi, cutting a piece of pancake, presented it to Yato leaving him no room to decline. Upon tasting, Yato remarked on its warmth and softness. Since she shared his belief that the sense of taste, much like a muscle, requires regular exercise to prevent atrophy, he observed that Yato's tactile and visual senses were intact and suggested he begin by appreciating the food's texture as a way to rekindle his gustatory experiences. Yato reminisced about the cherished moments of his youth, gathered with his grandfather and parents around the dinner table. During these times, Thistle, known as the Mad Sorcerer, would invariably accompany his grandfather. Initially introduced to the castle as a jester, Thistle's upbringing closely mirrored that of Yato's grandfather, to the extent that they were raised almost as brothers. Upon ascending the throne, Yato's grandfather encouraged Thistle to pursue magical studies, a field in which he excelled remarkably. Yato noted that their realm was rich in ancient artifacts left by dwarves and elves, among which dark arts relics were likely present. These powerful forces ensnared Thistle, leading him down a path of insanity. Ultimately, he succumbed to his corruption, imposing a curse of immortality upon the entire nation. Laios expressed their intention to initiate dialogue with the mad sorcerer and inquired where to find him. Yato, taken aback by their request, emphasized the sorcerer's aversion to conversation and recounted the stringent efforts to conceal their assistance in his grandfather's departure to the surface, noting that those suspected of aiding the escape faced execution. However, 
Yada revealed that arranging a meeting could be straightforward, directing them to observe the sorcerer's surveillance over the village through his eyes, indicating his impending arrival due to the detection of anomalies within the village. Yado elucidated the sorcerer's dominion over the dungeon, likening it to an extension of his own being, and acknowledged the potential peril of such power. Despite the risks, Laios reaffirmed their desire for an audience with the sorcerer. While Yado doubted the feasibility of a productive exchange, he proposed seeking the assistance of the winged lion, imprisoned within the dungeon's depths, as a countermeasure to temper the sorcerer's might. Yado guided the group outside, indicating the path that would lead them back to the castle, the dungeon. The villagers offered to provide some of their produce for the journey, although Yado cautioned against taking too much, mindful of the burden it would impose on those transporting the items. Chilchuck expressed curiosity about the means of their return, to which Yado confirmed they would utilize the same method that brought them to the village. Laios expressed gratitude to everyone for their hospitality, and the villagers extended their well wishes. As they departed, a woman questioned Yado's confidence in the party's significance, to which Yado expressed hope in their potential. Suddenly, Yado felt a grip around his neck, revealing the presence of the mad sorcerer, Thistle, whom Yado addressed by name. Thistle demanded to know the identities of the individual Yado had been speaking with. Upon their return to the dungeon, the party members found themselves awkwardly piled atop one another. Laios immediately identified their location as an ancient cistern constructed by dwarfs. Chilchuck, attempting to ascertain their precise location within the cistern, lamented the malfunction of his compass. Laios speculated that their current surroundings might also include remnants of a dwarven defensive stronghold, a thought that seemed to resonate with the group's understanding of dwarven architecture. Senshi, experiencing nausea, prompted Marcel to comment on the dwarves' known susceptibility due to sensitive semicircular canals within their inner ears, suggesting a potential cause for Senshi's discomfort. Laios wondered if gnomes might suffer similarly, though Marcel posited that mana sickness could also be a contributing factor. Azutsumi, regaining her usual demeanor, expressed confusion about their whereabouts. Marcel observed Azutsumi's return to her normal state with relief. Azutsumi, Recalling the events that transpired in the village, expressed her confusion. As she seated herself beside Senshi, Laio suggested they take a moment to rest in their current location while they explored the surrounding area further. Chilchuck remained behind with the others while Senshi identified some glyphs in their vicinity, urging Chilchuck to document all symbols etched into the surrounding columns. This, he believed, would help deduce their precise location within the cistern. Chilchuck, curious about Sinchi's expectation of finding more glyphs, learned that such markers often served as a navigational code among dwarves, known for their variable sense of direction. After Chilchuck had recorded the glyphs, Sinchi examined his findings and concluded that their location was likely the southeastern part of the structure. Laios and Marcel hurried back with news, rendering Sinchi's deduction seemingly redundant. Marcel urgently reported that they might have encountered Farlin presenting footprints she believed belonged to her. She explained that though she caught a glimpse of someone fleeing, she was certain of the silhouette's identity. Laios, however, remained skeptical, suggesting the possibility of a griffin or a similar creature, though he admitted to his uncertainty. Since she questioned Laios about the griffin, prompting an explanation that it's a creature combining avian features with the rear of a lion. Marcel expressed skepticism, citing a lack of any recorded griffin sightings within the dungeon. She presented some feathers to Chilchuck, who humorously retorted that he wasn't a hound, though Azutsumi remarked on their distinct animal scent. Marcel emphasized the urgency of locating Farlin, but since he hesitated, initially citing the mushrooms as his reason, he admitted never having encountered such mushrooms before, which Chilchuck recognized as poisonous and cautioned against consuming. Sinchi then confessed his aversion to griffins, perplexing Chilchuck, who questioned how Sinchi could dislike something he hadn't encountered. Despite Marcel's insistence, Sinchi appealed to Laios, requesting they abstain from the search. It was then that Azutsumi's attention was drawn to something looming overhead. Surprisingly, a griffin attempted to capture them, but they managed to elude its grasp. The creature soared away, confirming it was indeed a griffin, leaving the group in a mixture of awe and disappointment. Fascinated by the sight, Laios expressed his excitement at witnessing a griffin for the first time, contrasting with Marcel's frustration over the encounter. As the griffin circled back towards them, 
Marcel urged everyone to take cover. Senshi, overwhelmed by fear, chose to flee, inadvertently drawing the griffin's focus. Laios realized the impossibility of evading the griffin by turning and running, but Senshi, propelled by panic, continued his escape. This led to the griffin overtaking Senshi, leaving Laios and Marcel powerless to intervene. The effort to save Senshi was immediately initiated. Laios dashed forward, attempting to grasp Senshi, yet despite their collective effort, they failed to match the griffin's pace. Acknowledging the severity of their predicament, Laios admitted the sudden turn of events left them at a disadvantage. Marcel queried if Senshi was armed, to which Chilchuk confirmed he was not, prompting Laios to declare the necessity of immediate pursuit. However, the vastness of their surroundings left them uncertain of their direction. Izutsumi pondered the feasibility of scaling each pillar in search of Senshi, a suggestion Laios doubted, especially if Senshi had been carried to an elevated location. He turned to Marcel for alternative strategies. Marcel, after contemplation, proposed summoning a familiar to aid in their search. Laios, intrigued by the notion of employing a monster for assistance, listened as Marcel clarified her intent to create, rather than summon, a familiar, consulting her book for guidance. Marcel enumerated the three categories of summoning magic. The initial method involves commandeering an existing spirit or monster, a complex procedure that might draw the dungeon lord's attention, rendering it impractical for their current needs. The second approach manipulates a plant or animal into morphing into a monster, a process deemed too time-consuming and preparation-intensive for their urgent situation. The final, most pertinent option entails crafting a creature from scratch, tailored to their exigencies. Laios expressed concern over the apparent complexity of creating a being from nothing, to which Marcel acknowledged the challenge, especially if aiming for an autonomous entity. However, she clarified their goal was merely to construct a basic form capable of locomotion. Marcel then commenced the preparation of the summoning circle, beginning with the act of cutting her hair. She tasked Laios with gathering all available meat to incorporate into the pot, setting the stage for the ritual. Laios swiftly gathered the pot and meat, but Marcel suggested the need for additional ingredients. Returning without finding more meat, Laios listed cheese, eggs, and vegetables as available substitutes. Considering their potential to enhance the caloric content, Marcel consented, incorporating them into the pot. As Marcel meticulously prepared the magic circle, Laios expressed curiosity about the type of magic she was employing and whether it was within his capacity to learn. He implored her for instruction, but Marcel refused, emphasizing the necessity of adhering to formal protocols and acquiring the appropriate qualifications for handling such potent spells. Laios felt disheartened by her response. Azutsumi, meanwhile, questioned the circumstances surrounding Senshi's inclusion in their group and his apparent obsession with food, prompting a pause from Laios and Chilchuk. Azutsumi expressed disbelief over their lack of knowledge about Senshi, questioning the depth of their camaraderie. Laios admitted they never seized the opportunity to inquire, while Chilchuk shared their mutual disinterest in delving into personal matters, though he conceded Senshi's behavior and statements did spark his curiosity. He recalled Senshi claiming to have studied monster cuisine within the dungeon for a decade, despite its discovery only six years prior. Chilchuk also highlighted Senshi's possession of cooking utensils made from valuable materials and his proficiency in ancient dwarven scripts juxtaposed with his apparent fear of monsters in unexplored dungeon areas. Moreover, Senshi's tendency to infantilize him added to the intrigue surrounding his true nature and intentions. Chilchuk pointed out a prevalent misconception regarding halflings, where individuals unfamiliar with their race often mistakenly believe halflings to be juveniles who will eventually mature into dwarves or humans. He highlighted that such an error is typical among those from specific regions, particularly in the East, making it peculiar for anyone residing in those areas for a decade to be ignorant of halfling racial characteristics. This led Chilchuk to speculate that Sinchi might not originate from the surface world. Lados responded, suggesting that once Sinchi is rescued, they should create an opportunity for a formal reintroduction. In the meantime, Marcel concentrated on her spell casting. She meticulously drew a magic circle around the pot and recited incantations. As her spell reached completion, smoke emanated from the pot, indicating the magic had taken effect. 
Marcel then invited Lajos to lift the lid and inspect the result of her efforts. Upon removing the lid, Lajos was greeted by the sight of three small chicks peering back at him, prompting his confusion. Marcel, on the other hand, was elated, having been concerned about the success of her spell. She reassured Lajos that the appearance of the chicks was intentional, emphasizing the practicality of their creation over aesthetic considerations, and proceeded to release one of the birds into flight. Shortly thereafter, Marcel experienced disorientation, troubled by dual perceptions that overlaid one another, inducing nausea. She requested assistance to shield her eyes from the conflicting visuals, leading Lajos to promptly blindfold her. As Marcel contemplated the complexities of processing simultaneous perspectives from multiple sources, Chilchuk redirected the focus to their immediate priority, Sinchi's well-being. Marcel proposed to monitor the movements of dungeon cleaners and spirits for any irregularities within the dungeon, urging the group to accompany her. However, they inadvertently proceeded without her, prompting Marcel to remark on her inability to simultaneously fly and walk. Lajos offered to carry her, requesting Azutsumi and Chilchuk to manage his backpack. Marcel initially found the mode of transport alarming, fearing a fall, but eventually gained a semblance of stability by extending her arms like wings while secured on Lajos's back. Her conjured familiar observed the cleaners congregating around a specific pillar, leading Marcel to deduce Sinchi's location there. Through the avian familiar's perspective, she confirmed Sinchi's presence, noting he was attached to the pillar's apex. Lajos remarked on the griffin's strategy of securing Sinchi atop the pillar, presumably intending to return for him later. Marcel dispatched her birds to communicate with Sinchi, informing him of their rescue mission and inquiring about his recognition of her. As she contemplated strategies for retrieving Sinchi, Lajos cautioned her about the griffin's exceptional visual acuity, suggesting that the creature was likely already monitoring their movements. His suspicion was confirmed when Marcel suddenly lost her visual connection, prompting her to dismount from Lajos's back. Lajos elaborated on the griffin's physical prowess, highlighting its strong wings, agility, and capability for rapid power generation, in addition to its lethal talons and beak. He emphasized the futility of attempting to outmaneuver such a creature, reflecting on the evolutionary significance of its attributes. These characteristics, he noted, are essential for survival rather than mere decoration. Marcel inquired about the ideal form for the familiar to effectively challenge the griffin. Laios, while shaping the familiar, emphasized the significance of its horn for achieving a streamlined physique that reduces air resistance, enhancing its agility. He drew a parallel to the wyverns deployed by the mad sorcerer, renowned for their speed comparable to arrows. Inspired by this, he aimed to replicate a similar design. Handing the newly formed familiar to Marcel, he encouraged her to test its flight capabilities. With the familiar now adept at carrying a rope and showcasing markedly improved maneuverability, Marcel was confident in their strategy's success. She outlined a plan where she would engage the griffin's attention, allowing Sinchi the opportunity to descend. The rest of the group was instructed to ready themselves for combat, following her lead. While Marcel, still blindfolded, mimicked the motion of flight with her arms, Izutsumi watched inquisitively. Lajos explained the significance of Marcel feeling a sense of unity with the familiar. She then instructed Sinchi to utilize the rope, while Marcel, employing the familiar, engaged the griffin to draw its attention. Marcel was taken aback by the creature's speed, attempting to divert it by maneuvering beneath its form towards the ground. Despite her efforts, the griffin promptly destroyed the familiar. Removing her blindfold, Marcel expressed concern over their diminishing ability to assist. At that moment, Lajos conceived a promising strategy and took charge, proposing to craft a familiar that boasted enhanced strength and resilience. Eager to enhance their strategy, Lajos augmented the familiar by integrating additional horns, fangs, claws, and scales, envisioning a formidable double-headed dragon capable of emitting both fire and ice. Marcel, meanwhile, contemplated the most effective approach to overcome the griffin, debating whether increased defensive capabilities or bolstered defense were key. Abruptly seizing the familiar from Lajos, she asserted that neither fangs nor claws were necessary. Instead, she advocated for speed, elegance, and beauty, emphasizing the importance of determination and purpose in creating a being solely dedicated to rescuing Senshi. In that moment, 
Driven by Marcel's sincere intentions and supplications, a wondrous occurrence transpired. She christened her creation the Skyfish. Laios, somewhat unimpressed, deemed the name uninspired. However, Marcel, undeterred by his opinion, proceeded with their plan. The Skyfish embarked on its mission to retrieve Sinchi, with the Zutsumi marveling at its speed and Chilchuk finding its movements unsettling. Meanwhile, Marcel, mirroring the Skyfish's movements while blindfolded, lay on the ground. Sinchi seized this opportunity to descend via the rope, inadvertently drawing the griffin's focus. However, the skyfish swiftly diverted the griffin's pursuit, leading to a chase. Marcel skillfully maneuvered the familiar to strike the griffin decisively, impairing its wings and allowing Sinchi to continue his descent safely. The wounded griffin then descended to the ground, where Laios delivered the final blow. Sinchi safely reached the ground, prompting Marcel to focus her attention on the skyfish. She approached it, expressing gratitude for its efforts. Subsequently, Laios dismembered the skyfish, intrigued to find its interior filled with vegetables resembling organs, which unexpectedly moved Marcel to tears. Laios questioned if Marcel had further plans for it, while Chilchuk checked on Sinchi's condition. Laios explained to Marcel that the skyfish's purpose had been fulfilled, and consuming it served as a form of commemoration. He meticulously prepared the creature for cooking, seasoning the pieces and preparing a batter. After frying the pieces and carefully managing the wings to prevent burning, Laios presented the finished dish, skyfish and chips. Laios divided the dish and sampled it, discovering that the fusion of meat and vegetables created an exceptionally flavorful blend. Intrigued by the culinary potential of summoning creatures, he suggested Marcel consider documenting the technique in a book. However, Marcel dismissed the idea, noting the impracticality of expending a week's worth of provisions for a single meal. They prevented Azutsumi from consuming just the wings, while Chilchuk lamented their lack of alcohol. Offering some of the dish to a bewildered Senshi, Laios queried his interest in the griffin, proposing they drain its blood. Senshi declined, citing a diminished appetite. Abruptly, Chilchuk rose to share a bit about himself. He revealed his origins from a quaint village nestled in a valley basin to the northeast. For approximately a decade, he has roamed various dungeons, engaging in tasks such as lockpicking, translating, mediating, and conducting evaluations. Chilchuk also disclosed he has a wife and daughter whom he hasn't seen for years due to diverse reasons, a fact that surprised Marcel. Following his introduction, Chilchuk prompted Sinchi to share his background, inquiring about his reasons for residing in such a locale. Sinchi identified himself as a member of a modest mining collective from Isganda. Although their official pursuit was mining, their true ambition lay in uncovering ancient ruins predating the war, hoping to discover treasures that could secure their fortunes. Despite typically unearthing only ore, the rare discovery of relics like gears or lenses filled them with elation. Their quest eventually led to a significant discovery, an age-old castle adorned with gold, which is now known as the Dungeon. The dwarves were aware that the legendary castle wasn't merely a myth, it was the remnant of an ancient, fallen kingdom. Upon assessing its structure, they were astonished to discover it was constructed from pure gold. Despite its age, the castle appeared as if it had been erected merely a couple of days prior. One of the dwarves, apprehensive about delving further into the castle, suggested they return to the surface to adequately prepare for exploration. This suggestion was met with disbelief by his companions, who were incredulous at his cautious response to such a discovery. This cautious dwarf was a younger Senshi, whom his peers teased about having iron coursing through his veins. When questioned about his age, Senshi stated he was 36 at the time. Another dwarf advised him not to overexert himself due to his youth, offering him the option to remain behind. Senshi, however, felt demeaned by this suggestion and, driven by a desire for gold, insisted on entering the castle, despite internally fearing isolation. As they advanced deeper into the castle, Senshi's reluctance grew. Initially, his companions were merely ambitious, but their demeanor gradually became unnerving, with their eyes shining unnaturally in the dark. It seemed as if an unseen force within the castle was compelling them to venture further into its depths. During their rigorous exploration, an unforeseen event abruptly occurred. One of the dwarves announced an encounter with a formidable adversary. A colossal bird-like creature materialized unexpectedly, resulting in Toten's demise. 
This incident led to the chilling realization that their surroundings had transformed into a dungeon, instilling a swift wave of panic among them. Despite their attempts to escape, they found themselves ensnared by an inexplicably appearing wall, confirming their entrapment. Amidst the fear, the group's leader reassured them, emphasizing that dungeons maintain a link to the surface. He urged calmness and a methodical search for an exit. As they navigated the dungeon's labyrinth, evading monstrous inhabitants, peculiar phenomena occurred tailored to their immediate needs. Fountains materialized to quench their thirst, rooms to rest and emerge when fatigue set in, and shadowy figures of enticing women attempted to lure them. Ultimately, their provisions were depleted, confronting them with the grim prospect of starvation should they continue to evade the dungeon's denizens. The realization dawned that securing food might necessitate combat. The dwarves speculated that the dungeon's monsters must rely on some form of sustenance to survive. One dwarf expressed his disbelief at having to utilize the weapons, which had been inherited through generations, for their original combat purposes. Invar and Brig Gon were assigned the role of defense, tasked with shielding the group, while Nur and the team leader prepared to engage in combat against a monster. Since she was assigned the task of mapping the area, following the skirmish, the group sustained an injury. They encountered the bird monster once more, although it quickly retreated. In the midst of addressing the injured dwarf's needs, Sinchi was sidelined. Despite his offer to assist in future food-gathering efforts, he was deemed a liability and thus excluded from the task. Nevertheless, the group managed to secure some provisions, which they shared with Sinchi. Reflecting on the situation, Sinchi grappled with feelings of uselessness and guilt, troubled by his inability to contribute despite his hunger. The moment arrived when their focus shifted from seeking an exit to the dire quest for sustenance. The bird relentlessly stalked them, each encounter resulting in the loss of a companion. Devoid of any other source of nourishment, they were compelled to slaughter their horse. They surmised the creature to be a griffin, distinguished by its eagle-like appearance and quadrupedal stance. Senshi, puzzled by the griffin's relentless attacks, questioned its motives, wondering if it was driven by hunger. The leader speculated that the griffin might derive enjoyment from their demise, suggesting that such malevolence could be intrinsic to monsters. Since she was reassured not to fret, with the leader promising that they would vanquish the griffin during its next assault and consume it. Offered another portion of food, since she was encouraged to honor and sacrifice by partaking heartily in the meal. That night, since she was roused by a discussion. A dwarf expressed dissatisfaction with Sinchi receiving the largest share of food, labeling him as unproductive. However, the group's leader countered, highlighting Sinchi's status as a youth in growth and underscoring their duty as adults to nurture him. Despite concerns over limited supplies, the leader advocated for Sinchi, emphasizing his potential to unlock the mysteries of the dungeon, which might lead them to escape. He stressed the importance of investing in the younger generation for their collective survival. Yet, the descending dwarf remained unswayed, threatening to expel Sinchi should he perceive any further favoritism. The following morning, Sinchi was presented with the day's collected provisions, which included items like wine and cheese. Puzzled by their presence, Sinchi questioned their origin. The leader explained that orcs, establishing a community within the dungeon, were responsible for these goods. Upon Sinchi's inquiry about the orc's survival, he learned that being demi-humans, Akin to half-monsters, orcs likely coexisted peacefully with the dungeon's creatures. However, once the orcs heightened their security due to frequent thefts, the group faced a period devoid of food. With only three members remaining, a profound sense of hunger overwhelmed Sinchi, leading him to contemplate whether his purported dwarven resilience implied he could consume rocks for sustenance. This thought provoked Briggon into accusing Sinchi of concealing food, escalating into a dispute. The leader attempted to de-escalate the situation by taking Briggon outside, hoping to alleviate Sinchi's distress. However, the conflict outside intensified, marked by fierce altercations and screams, eventually succumbing to an unsettling silence. Upon Jiren's entrance into the room, Sinchi immediately questioned the events that transpired, particularly Briggon's whereabouts. Jiren advised against venturing outside, explaining that a griffin attack had occurred. He claimed to have slain the griffin, although Brigon was fatally injured in the encounter. Sinchi noticed a significant injury on Jiren's head, indicative of a blow from a blunt object. Jiren proposed they consume the griffin, 
suggesting that boiling its meat could sustain them for several days. Following this plan, they boiled the griffin meat, which Sinchi found had an offensive odor, was tough, and tasted dreadful. Despite this, he found himself unable to resist consuming the broth, completely engrossed in the act of eating. Sinchi methodically finished his meal while Jiren excused himself, claiming the need to relieve himself. However, Jiren did not return, leaving Sinchi all by himself. Despite Sinchi's reluctance to confront the reality outside the door, he meticulously rationed the remaining griffin meat while scrutinizing the maps he had crafted. His studies unveiled the mysteries of the runes etched into the dungeon's walls. Gathering the courage to step outside eventually, Sinchi discovered that any sign of his companions had vanished, presumably scattered by the dungeon's inhabitants. Subsequently, he was seized by orcs and detained in their settlement. However, through communication, he found common ground with them. In a mutually beneficial exchange, Sinchi imparted knowledge of the ancient dwarven language to the orcs, who in turn educated him on identifying mushrooms safe for consumption and strategies for monster interaction. This newfound understanding paved Sinchi's way back to the surface. Reflecting on his experiences within the dungeon, Sinchi realized he couldn't return to his homeland, opting instead to establish a new life near the dungeon and its upper echelons. The town above gradually became interconnected with the dungeon, attracting a flood of adventurers. Sinchi harbored concerns about the true nature of the meat he consumed, suspecting it might not have been griffin meat. The peculiar taste of that soup, unlike any monster meat he had previously encountered, haunted his meals with unwelcome recollections. In the present, Sinchi admitted his aversion to confronting the griffin stemmed from a fear of uncovering the truth behind that meat. Marcel expressed disbelief at his ordeal. Laios, however, proposed they attempt consuming the griffin to address Sinchi's apprehensions. This suggestion startled the others, but Laios rationalized that Sinchi's lengthy future shouldn't be overshadowed by dread at every meal. He argued that understanding whether the taste matched Sinchi's memory could provide closure or dispel his fears, suggesting the cook of the soup would not have wished for Sinchi to live in such a manner. Chilchuk doubted Sinchi's desire for this knowledge, while Azutsumi was taken aback by Laios's proposition. Nonetheless, Laios sought Sinchi's personal stance on the matter. After giving it considerable thought, Sinchi consented to partake in the meal. With the decision made, Laios aimed to replicate the original dining experience as closely as possible. Opting for rudimentary cuts over precise butchery, he emphasized the necessity of sampling meat from both the griffin's upper and lower sections, hypothesizing that each might offer a distinct flavor profile. Some in the group speculated that Laios's meticulous preparations were merely a pretext to justify consuming the griffin. As he dissected the creature, Laios couldn't help but admire its muscular build, acknowledging its predatory nature. He pondered the griffin's aggressive pursuit of Sinchi and his group, noting its unusual behavior of not consuming its human victims. Laios speculated that their horse might have been the catalyst for the griffin's relentless attacks, considering griffin's well-known desire for horses. Laios further mused that while griffins are known for their patience, they typically do not stray far from their territory for hunting, suggesting there was a compelling motive for its actions, though it remained unidentified. Chilchuk then engaged Laios in conversation, suggesting they halt the cooking process if Laios had pieced together the puzzle. He questioned Laios about the cause of the blunt force trauma to Jiren's helmet, arguing that a griffin's attack methods, its talons and beak, would not result in such an injury, indicating that Jiren's death was not caused by the griffin. This led to the conclusion that an internal conflict had escalated into a fatal altercation between Jiren and Brig Gon, with Jiren succumbing to a severe head injury. Chilchuk implored Laios to consider the implications of continuing with their plan, fearing it could bring harm to Sinchi. Despite the unfolding discussion, Laios pressed on with the meal preparation, pondering the fate of the other three dwarves who had encountered a bird-like creature. He speculated whether their identification of the monster was erroneous, drawing parallels to their mistaken identification of Farlin as a griffin. Laios considered the variety of large-winged creatures such as harpies, sirens, rocks, simurgs, cockatrices, and basilisks, particularly focusing on those with blunt appendages. However, Marcel interrupted his train of thought, announcing that the water was boiling. Laios consulted Sinchi on whether the preparation required anything beyond boiling the meat, to which Sinchi confirmed the simplicity of the recipe. 
Nonetheless, Laios felt the need to enhance the dish with at least a garnish for flavor. He questioned Sinchi about his ability to distinguish mushrooms, learned from the orcs, and whether he recognized the type they had. Sinchi admitted unfamiliarity with the mushrooms in question. Passing the responsibility to Marcel, Laios queried if she should just add the meat to the boiling water, sparking a debate about concluding their efforts. Sinchi insisted on proceeding, declaring his readiness to face whatever result the soup might yield. Taking charge, Sinchi added the meat to the pot, creating two variations of griffin soup, one from each half of the body. Upon tasting, Sinchi found the aroma, flavor, and texture starkly different from his previous experience. The group expressed concern over Sinchi's reaction to the soup, but Sinchi assured them he felt relieved, as if a burden had been lifted from his shoulders. He surmised that Jiren's final actions were driven by a desperate desire for his survival, leaving Sinchi to bear the weight of those final moments. The group was initially upset with Laios for his insistence on proceeding with the meal, but Laios, focused on the taste of the griffin meat, remarked on its excessively gamey and tough nature, along with an unpleasant aftertaste. This led him to conclude that what Sinchi had consumed in the past was not griffin meat, but he noted it wasn't dwarfed meat either. Laios speculated that the creature they encountered was not a griffin but a hippogriff, noting the key difference in their lower halves and dietary habits. Hippogriffs can subsist on fruit and do not strictly pursue prey. Laios theorized that the hippogriff's persistent pursuit might have been driven by curiosity or mating instincts, especially given its interest in their horse. He highlighted that hippogriffs, equipped with hooved hind legs, possess a unique offensive capability unlike griffins. This revelation surprised the group, with Laios convinced that the difference in taste Sinchi noted could be attributed to the hippogriff. Sinchi, finding solace in this explanation, expressed his gratitude. Despite the lack of an opportunity to taste hippogriff meat and directly compare it to griffin meat, Lagos suggested that they undertake this comparison themselves. This proposal took the group aback. The group wondered how they could possibly acquire a hippogriff. Lagos suggested they already had access to one, mentioning historical instances of such creatures emerging from the dungeon. He pondered the oversight of their presence, especially given their recent encounter with the griffin, an anomaly within the dungeon's ecosystem. Laios identified changelings as a contributing factor to the confusion, surprising Chilchuk with this revelation. He elaborated on the folklore surrounding changelings, creatures known for replacing children with their own monstrous kind, a deception attributed to magical mushrooms capable of transforming any living being that enters their vicinity. Understanding the nature of changelings led to efforts to eradicate them, significantly reducing their sightings. However, Laios pointed out the existence of these mushrooms nearby, their influence suspected in the griffin's uncharacteristic behavior and the peculiar death of the familiar. Convinced of the griffin's true identity, Laios proposed an experiment, placing the griffin meat within a fairy ring created by the changelings to confirm its transformation into a hippogriff. Heeding Chilchuk's caution against inadvertently entering the circle, they observed the meat's transformation, noting its altered, more appetizing appearance. Motivated by this discovery, Laios proceeded to prepare soup from the newly transformed meat, resulting in what they dubbed hippogriff soup. Upon sampling the soup, Sinchi was visibly moved to tears, surprising the others. They reassured him that flavors can significantly vary with different conditions and contexts, suggesting he needn't dwell on the past. However, Sinchi expressed a deep-seated yearning to relive the taste of that soup, reminiscent of the time spent with his former companions and voiced his gratitude towards the current group. He shared an insight gained through years within the dungeon, its profound response to the desires of those within it. While it rewards those like the orcs, who harbor no desires, it shows its menacing side to those who yearn for something more. With their quest now expanding to include not only rescuing Farland, but also confronting the mad sorcerer, finding the winged lion, and lifting the curse, Sinchi warned of the dungeon's increasingly hostile reaction. Despite the anticipated challenges, Sinchi expressed his eagerness to impart further knowledge to them. Questioning if they would continue to include him in their journey, the group unanimously affirmed his place among them. Thus, united in their resolve, they pressed onward towards their multifaceted goal. As Laios and his companions delved deeper into the dungeon on their quest to find Farlin, they were suddenly afflicted with severe fevers, halting their progress to recuperate. Laios, assessing everyone's condition, 
found they were all experiencing intense cold and poor health. He himself was not spared, suffering from profuse sweating and widespread pain, suspecting food poisoning from their diverse diet as the culprit. Despite his concerns, Laios was determined not to let their journey in due to illness, his thoughts lingering on his sister. Awakening from his sleep, he noticed an unexpected lightness in his body, initially relieved, thinking the sickness had passed. Yet, he soon discovered something appeared altered. To his astonishment, Laios realized his physical form had changed. He urgently sought Marcel's observation, only to find she had also undergone a transformation, as had Sinchi, now resembling an elf woman. The revelation of Sinchi's new form left Laios in disbelief. The commotion woke Chilchuk, whose appearance had similarly evolved, eliciting screams of shock from the group at their mutual transformations. Laios speculated that they might have inadvertently traversed a changeling circle, attributing their metamorphoses to these magical fungi known for their ability to morph living beings into closely related species. He reasoned that if such mushrooms could alter a hippogriff into a griffin, their own transformations were equally plausible. Transformed by the dungeon's mysterious forces, Laios became a dwarf, Sinchi an elf, Marcel a halfling, and Chilchuk a human, while Azutsumi found herself in the form of a dog. Faced with their altered states, Laios pondered the possibility of reverting to their original forms, suggesting a return through the path they came might be their only option. Marcel questioned if crossing back into the Changeling Circle could restore their former selves, but Laios, uncertain of this solution, asked them to check outside. But they noticed the path had altered, complicating their return. During their restless sleep, Marcel experienced uncontrollable shaking, wondering if it was the dungeon morphing around them rather than her body trembling. With doubts about retracing their steps, Laios suggested making their way back to the cisterns, prompting a swap of their attire to suit their new forms. Laios, feeling the advantages of his dwarven physique, including enhanced night vision and increased strength, contemplated his new capabilities with a hint of excitement. He then checked on Chilchuk, who described his human body as burdensome and enveloped in a thick, clear layer, dulling his senses yet providing a strangely soothing effect. Chilchuk appreciated the new perspective his height offered, despite Azutsumi pointing out the decline in his hearing. She remarked on the fittingness of Chilchuk's newfound calm demeanor, suggesting it suited him well in light of their extraordinary circumstances. Laios queried Chilchuk about the traditions in his homeland for dealing with those transformed into trolls, wondering if there existed any folk remedies for such a predicament. Chilchuk shared that his culture is rife with tales offering such advice as burn them with a flame to reveal their true form, or a bucket full of water will restore their original state. Yet he lamented that these tales often led to nothing more than the mistreatment of children, a thought that deeply disturbed him. Faced with the necessity of finding a solution, Laios conceded that seeking the transformative mushrooms was their only viable option, despite his concern that another transformation might occur upon re-entering the circle. Nonetheless, he humorously mused on the rarity of witnessing a real troll, a curiosity hard for him to abandon. During their navigation through the dungeon, the group skillfully evaded numerous traps, improvising solutions to bypass them. This ordeal, initially daunting, soon became an avenue for them to showcase their adaptability, making notable progress in their journey. However, not everyone felt comfortable with their newfound forms. Upon encountering a lion's head statue, Izutsumi speculated on its significance, suggesting it might indicate their path forward. Laios recognized a familiar door, leading Marcel to realize they had stumbled upon their intended destination all along. Their observation of a makeshift campsite led them to surmise that other adventurers had recently been through the area, kindling hope that these travelers might possess the knowledge to restore them to their true forms. Laios observed that their predecessors likely didn't breach the door, possibly opting for a teleportation spell to escape back to the surface instead. Pondering their next move, Laios suggested continuing their quest for the winged lion despite their altered forms, a proposition that initially took the group aback. He reasoned that the dungeon seemed intent on thwarting their escape efforts, positing that advancing forward might prove more fruitful than futile attempts to revert their transformations, especially considering the array of solutions awaiting them upon their return to the surface. Though initially met with reluctance, Marcel acknowledged Lyoza's logic, noting their surprising adaptability to their current predicaments. The conversation turned to the obstacle of the sealed door, 
which appeared impervious to conventional methods of entry. Izatsumi questioned their strategy for overcoming this barrier, highlighting the futility of their situation given the door's resistance to opening. Chilchuk, approached for his expertise in lockpicking, clarified the absence of a physical lock, suggesting a magical seal instead. Marcel confirmed the presence of mana but indicated the need for time, appropriate tools, and resources to unravel the magic sealing the door. With no immediate solution at hand, they resorted to knocking on the door and imploring the winged lion for assistance. It was then that Laios noticed an unusual reaction from his sword, Kinsuku, mistaking the sword's response to the cold as a sign of its demise. An entity from Laios' sword slithered towards the gate, causing it to tremble and rumble, leading Marcel to wonder if the winged lion had granted them its power. Laio speculated that perhaps Yato played a role in this occurrence. Regardless of the source, they expressed their gratitude. Suddenly, they heard rustling from above the gate, and to their surprise, gargoyles appeared, prompting them to brace for a confrontation. Gargoyles, essentially animated statues, were familiar adversaries to Chilchuk, who was confident they wouldn't pose significant trouble. Recalling their presence in the dungeon's early days, he decided to retreat, deeming himself superfluous to the battle. Unexpectedly, a gargoyle targeted him, much to his astonishment, attributing its focus to his conspicuous height among the group. The encounter escalated with a massive explosion that knocked everyone to the ground. While Chilchuk was spared a direct hit, Marcel was not so fortunate, succumbing to mana sickness from the blast. Laios, assessing their precarious situation, directed Izutsumi to assist Chilchuk. However, noting Izutsumi's distress, panting and overwhelmed by the noise and scent of blood, Laios commanded her to halt, fearing her inability to cease fighting until potentially fatal consequences ensued. Senshi and Laios had to manage the situation somehow. Laios suggested Senshi use his pod as a weapon, only to find that Senshi, now in an elf's form, carried no weapons due to their weight. With limited options, Laios took on the gargoyles himself, finding the sword and pot unexpectedly lighter and more manageable in his current state. Despite this advantage, he quickly felt fatigued, recalling that most dwarves he knew preferred lighter armor for mobility. With the gate now open, Laios urged everyone to escape through it. Senshi, tasked with carrying Marcel, hurried through the door. Laios signaled Azutsumi to follow and tossed something towards the gate for her to chase, ensuring her swift departure. He then checked on Chilchuk's ability to run, instructing him to carry the pot light as they fled. Engaging briefly with the gargoyles before retreating, Laios and his group managed to shut the gate behind them, sealing the gargoyles out. Exhausted from the ordeal and frustrated by the limitations of their transformed bodies, the group acknowledged the irreversible nature of their situation. They expressed hope for encountering more transformative mushrooms ahead to possibly revert their changes. After lighting the area with Marcel's magic, they observed the dwarven ruins on the other side of the gate. With the immediate threat behind them, Lyo suggested they prepare some food to recuperate. Lyo's now understood Sinchi's penchant for spontaneously starting to prepare food. His current form seemed to intensify his hunger. However, Chilchuk remarked that he had never observed Namari engage in such abrupt culinary activities. Sinchi suggested that cooking provided an excellent opportunity for self-reflection. Following this, Laios began the food preparation by combining flour, water, salt, and eggs into a dough, which he then allowed to rest. While waiting, he prepared the filling by mixing minced meat with onions and other vegetables. He shaped the dough into a cylinder, sliced it evenly, and then rolled each piece into thin wrappers. With everyone's help, they filled and wrapped the dumplings, finding the quiet activity surprisingly soothing. After boiling water, they cooked the dumplings until they floated to the surface, waiting an additional two to three minutes before seasoning them with black pepper. The result was hippogriff dumplings. Izutsumi observed that, while they resembled familiar dumplings, their aroma was distinctly unique. Chilchuk mentioned that back home, dumplings were typically fried. Upon trying them, Izutsumi was caught off guard by their heat. Despite Sinchi's warning, she had already burnt herself. Marcel commented on the surprising tastiness of the dumplings, pondering if different races perceived tastes differently. Laios believed that the dumplings' flavor would be universally appreciated, regardless of racial differences in taste perception. 
Distinct races and regions boast their unique dumpling recipes, yet all manage to produce delectable results. Layos mused on this variety, likening it to their current situation. Despite undergoing changes, they remained fundamentally the same and were determined to adapt successfully. Layos initially felt things were settling well, but Chilchuk pointed out that this was merely wishful thinking, noting the distinctiveness of their current location. Layos acknowledged that such areas were occasionally encountered elsewhere. Marcel identified their surroundings as a dwarven defense point from the ancient conflict between elves and dwarves, expressing surprise that such historical events were not covered in her education. This rivalry had pushed both factions to develop increasingly advanced technologies, culminating in a catastrophic event. The lingering legacy of this conflict persists in the dungeon's relics, making dwarves and elves wary of repeating past mistakes, especially concerning dungeon technologies. Marcel mentioned that this particular dungeon had been a battleground for various cultures, suggesting any intervention might ignite significant contention. When Chilchuk pondered if Marcel could leverage her supposed royal connections to mediate potential conflicts with the elves, she questioned why she should be the one to handle it. Lyos humorously noted that since Marcel was currently a halfling, negotiating with elves might necessitate Sinchi's involvement. Sinchi, now an elf, jestingly assured them of her best effort. The group then collectively acknowledged the need to continue their search for a way to revert to their original forms, a goal they unanimously agreed upon. Leading the way, Chilchuk noticed the others trailing behind after Marcel stumbled, prompting him to pause. Lyo suggested slowing their pace due to the uneven flooring, leading to a brief halt for rest. Chilchuk apologized, unaware he had been moving quickly. A question preoccupied Chilchuk. The discrepancy between their actual ages versus the apparent age of their current forms. He inquired about Layo's age, who disclosed he was 26. When asked to estimate Layo's age in his dwarven form, since he guessed 60, sparking a conversation about the lifespan differences between species, they speculated whether their aging process would align with their original species or adapt to the lifespan of their new forms, pondering the implications of their transformed lifespans. Chilchuk observed Marcel's indifferent expression and raised concerns about their lifespan post-transformation, especially highlighting that halflings typically live up to 50 years, potentially leaving Marcel with less than four decades. Marcel, taken aback, realized she had overestimated halfling lifespans, believing them to span a century. Lyos added that while some halflings do live exceptionally long, such cases are rare. Marcel fell silent, pondering this revelation. Chilchuk then lightened the mood by admitting his previous comments were in jest, aiming to highlight the implausibility of their situation. He speculated that if transformation were so easily achievable through mushrooms, there'd be a high demand for such a miracle, yet no market exists for them. This suggests that the transformations might either be temporary or carry significant drawbacks. Lyos contemplated these potential side effects, considering their utility but acknowledging complications. Chilchuk's curiosity piqued about Lago's interest in becoming a demi-human, while Marcel sought clarification on Lago's aspirations. Lago's clarified that he hadn't been contemplating what Chilchuk suggested. Instead, his thoughts were centered on his sister. He envisioned an ideal scenario where they triumph over the mad sorcerer, Farlin regains her clarity, and they ascend to the surface, only to face societal fears due to her draconic lower half. He mused over the possibility of concealing her dragon aspect tease her integration. He recognized the difficulty large monsters face in human settlements due to low mana levels, drawing a parallel to a fish's survival out of water. Lyo speculated that Farland's existence among humans might inherently be fraught with challenges. He then pondered the potential of the mushrooms to alter Farland's form into a less intimidating dragon variety, facilitating her life among humans. Chilchuk marveled at Lyo's hopeful disposition. Lyo's admitted his personal interest in transformation, critiquing humans as mundane and uninspired. He humorously contemplated the practical benefits of becoming a troll, especially for physical labor. Suddenly, Marcel detected an unusual noise. Lyo's inquired if it was the sound of the dwarven ruins, but Marcel described it as resembling stones clashing. The noise appeared to be approaching rapidly. After a moment of consideration, she realized it was the sound of gargoyles. Izutsumi questioned whether the door had been secured, to which Lyos admitted uncertainty about how to lock it. Marcel urged haste, 
fearing the imminent arrival of their pursuers. Lyos proposed that confronting them might be more effective than fleeing, suggesting an ambush. He offered to distract the gargoyles while Chilchuk and Azutsumi prepared for a counterattack. Upon Marcel's alert that the gargoyles were upon them, the creatures indeed emerged, focusing their assault on Lyos, who lost grip of his sword during the fray. The gargoyles seized the weapon, prompting Lyos to caution the group. In the midst of the chaos, Marcel, disoriented and spinning, was steadied by Chilchuk, who remarked on the imprudence of her actions during combat and commented on her unchanged clumsiness. Marcel and Chilchuk diverted the attention of the gargoyle that had seized Kin Suku. When the gargoyle hurled the sword, it embedded itself in the ground, releasing a plume of smoke. Chilchuk, cradling Marcel, inquired if she had conjured a spell. Lyos, assessing their condition, learned they were unharmed, the sword having flown between their arms. Lyos requested the sword from Chilchuk, who complied but observed an alteration in its appearance. Chilchuk deduced the smoke was the result of changeling spores, a revelation that took them aback given the absence of a mushroom ring. He hypothesized their interlocked arms had inadvertently formed a ring. Concurrently, Lyos, Izutsumi, and Sinchi confronted assaults from other gargoyles. Marcel urgently proposed they join hands to form a circle to Izutsumi's skepticism, urging a practical suggestion. Marcel insisted on her plan's efficacy. Upon uniting hands, they anticipated the gargoyles' passage through their makeshift ring, hoping this would alter the gargoyles' forms as Marcel predicted. During an attack, Lyos grabbed Marcel, but Azutsumi yanked her in another direction, causing Marcel's arm to ache and disrupting their formed circle. As a result, Marcel and Azutsumi tumbled to the ground. Spotting an approaching gargoyle, Marcel evaded it by rolling away, which resulted in the gargoyle becoming immobilized. They quickly encircled the trapped gargoyle, clasping hands to reform the circle, and upon completion, smoke billowed out. When the smoke dissipated, they observed the gargoyle had transformed, leaving them astounded by the effect. Lyos remarked on the swift change induced by the changelings on non-living entities, akin to the instantaneous alteration of the meat. Subsequently, another gargoyle struck Lyos. Marcel, concerned, inquired about his condition, to which he replied that despite the pain, his dwarf form's resilience spared him from serious harm. The group noted the remaining gargoyle's reluctance to descend from the ceiling, prompting them to devise a strategy to lure it through their circle. Lyos and Chilchuk, sharing a glance with Marcel, proposed a plan, confident in its execution. United, they decided to entice the gargoyle by becoming targets, thereby narrowing the gap and compelling it to engage. Chilchuk suggested synchronizing their steps as they executed their plan, which puzzled Marcel, who was unclear about the intended strategy. As they moved forward, chanting their step count rhythmically, the gargoyle readied its assault. Lyos inquired if Marcel was prepared, to which she admitted confusion about his reference. Abruptly, they threw Marcel into the air, causing the gargoyle to swoop through their linked arms and miss its target. The group landed clumsily, and Lyos found himself splattered with some fluid. Observing the gargoyle's transformation signified the end of their ordeal. Lyos reassured everyone that rinsing off the spores would revert them to their original states, although Marcel expressed doubts. Lyos advocated for a thorough wash, labeling them as unwitting cultivators of changeling mushrooms. He hypothesized about the mushroom's peculiar life cycle. An animal transformed and subsequently shunned by its kind would flee, perish, and give rise to a new mushroom circle. Chilchuk commented on the bizarre nature of this mechanism. Lyos mentioned that unlike the gargoyles, reverting to their original forms might take some time, so they should look for a spot to camp. He suggested to Sinchi that they cook a meal and wait out their transformation, to which Sinchi concurred. After securing the statue and gathering water from it, Lyos bathed and examined his sword, noting significant alterations in Kin Suku, puzzled if its transformation into a key was influenced by the changelings and whether it would revert upon washing. Azutsumi inquired about the day's meal, to which Sinchi replied they would cook the leftover dumplings. Displeased with the repetitive menu, Azutsumi expressed her boredom with the dumplings, prompting Sinchi to consider a different preparation method. He opted to fry them in oil until the dumpling wrappers were nicely browned and then drained them of any excess grease. Sinchi acknowledged Azutsumi's selective eating habits and small appetite, recognizing the need to exert extra effort in cooking to ensure she ate adequately. 
Senshi offered the fried dumplings to Izutsumi, but she remained unimpressed. Observing the transformed gargoyle, he was struck with an idea and decided to feed a dumpling to its mouth. Miraculously, the dumpling's shape altered, akin to the effect of a ring. This discovery hinted at a variety of potential dumpling transformations. Azatsumi expressed her worry about the possible growth of mushrooms within them after consuming such altered dumplings. Since she reassured her by mentioning their prior consumption of hippogriff didn't lead to such outcomes, attributing it to their robust digestive systems. He then enlisted Azatsumi's assistance in organizing their dinner plates. The creation, dubbed Changeling Dumplings via Fairy Ring, resulted in an assortment of uniquely transformed dumplings. Izutsumi, upon tasting one, recognized the flavor of Baromet's meat, which Sinchi clarified had become mutton, indicating that ingredients could transform as well. Marcel discovered her dumpling contained cheese, while Lyos was delighted with a sweet-tasting one. Later, as they rested, Chilchuk was rudely awakened by Lyos' foot on his face. His reaction to this intrusion and subsequent complaint about Lyo's lengthy limbs marked the moment they all realized their bodies had reverted to their original forms. It was time to set off again. Considering the warmer climate of the level, they opted for lighter attire, appropriate for the conditions. Since she remarked on the favorable temperature for the proliferation of life forms, although he cautioned that there was no certainty of encountering any ahead. He expressed regret over not having prepared sausages in advance. Chilchuk inquired about the dragon meat sausages he had previously made, to which Sinchi recalled they had unfortunately lost them. As they gathered their belongings, Marcel pointed out an oddity with Lyoza's sword, noticing it was wrapped in cloth. Curious, she questioned the reason behind this, leading Lyos to explain that placing Kin Suku in a scabbard would make it overly warm and uncomfortable. Reluctantly revealing the sword at Marcel's insistence, they discovered its appearance had altered, now adorned with mushrooms. Izatsumi half-jokingly proposed they form a circle around Lyos and discipline him for this oversight. Ultimately, they advised Lyos to cleanse the sword in water immediately. As they delved deeper into the dungeon, Lyos inquired about their surroundings. Marcel reported encountering an unusual structure, devoid of alternative routes. Prompted by curiosity, the group investigated the peculiar building. Since she discovered an automated trolley inside, prompting them to explore further. Chilchuk humorously considered dismantling it for profit, but the vehicle unexpectedly activated. Since she clarified his innocence and its activation, the trolley seemed programmed to commence once occupied. He found instructions, advising the party to settle in as he reviewed them. The vehicle, identified as a trolley, prompted varying reactions among the group Chilchuk felt drowsy, and the women took the opportunity to rest. Since she relayed the trolley's regulations, such as prohibitions on alcohol consumption, movement during transit, and extending limbs outside. Deeming the vehicle safe, Lyos encouraged them to proceed with their journey. Since she then initiated tea preparation, utilizing roasted dried seeds. Lyos, uncertain of his effectiveness, drew a magic circle to aid in heating. Despite the slow process, it seemed to work. The conversation shifted towards Lyos and his sister's adventuring motivations, with Sinchi expressing curiosity about Lyos's lack of interest in wealth. Lyos shared that his journey began in his teenage years when he grew disillusioned with his village life. Seeking change, he moved to a town for schooling and joined the military, only to find himself ill-suited to that environment as well. His path took a turn when he joined a merchant caravan, doing various tasks as he ventured southward, eventually reaching the island. It was there he planned to briefly reunite with Farlin, who was studying at a nearby magic academy, before continuing on his journey. However, Farlin chose to accompany him to the island, where they found employment due to the booming gold mining industry, eventually leading them to regular dungeon explorations and meeting their current companions. Sinchi commented on Lyoza's seemingly aimless life trajectory, prompting further inquiry into Farlin's decision to leave a promising academy life behind. Lyos explained that Farlin's unique magical abilities led to her being shunned from a young age. Tired of the negative environment, he left the village a year prior to Farlin, indicating the deep-seated issues that led to their current adventuring lifestyle. Farlin remained alone until she enrolled in the Magic Academy, where she continued her solitary meals until befriending Marcel. Lyos shared how this knowledge pained him, emphasizing Farlin's resilient spirit 
which seemed to surpass his own. Despite being distanced, Farland maintained correspondence with their parents, suggesting she might not dwell on their separation. Determined never to abandon Farlin again, Lyos vowed to stay by her side until she chooses otherwise. This conversation was interrupted by Azutsumi's frustration over their murmuring, but she was shocked by Marcel's emotional outpouring. Marcel reminisced about Farlin's gestures of bringing her various natural gifts, pondering the reasons behind these acts. Lyos interpreted these actions as Farlin's desire to share meals with Marcel. Overwhelmed by this realization, Marcel wept, expressing her longing to dine with Farlin once more. Lyos reassured her that they would indeed share meals with Farlin again soon, providing a glimmer of hope amidst their emotional journey. Since she likened Farlin's current state to a serving of bacon and eggs, where the eggs rest atop the bacon, seemingly connected yet easily separable, illustrating Farlin's situation. Conversely, Izutsumi's condition was compared to an omelette, rich with various ingredients that, while potentially separable, could end up in disarray if attempted. This analogy led Lyos to contemplate whether removing Farland's draconic lower half would revert her to human form, a notion since she suggested wasn't straightforward. Since she recounted utilizing the red dragon's meat for preservation, noting that while most reverted back to its original form and merged with Farland, a portion consumed during their meal did not. This observation led him to deduce that flesh ingested and assimilated by another life form loses its distinctiveness. In a dungeon where the boundaries between life and death blur, this principle stands as a clear, unambiguous rule to Sinchi. Sinchi proposed that if they consume the draconic aspect of Farlin, they might succeed in extricating the dragon's soul from her. This suggestion elicited a range of reactions. Lyos expressed surprise at Sinchi's stance, anticipating he might be against such a method due to his views on resurrection. Sinchi clarified his position, emphasizing that while he opposes resurrecting the dead, Farlin remains alive and he is willing to help liberate her from the dungeon's influence. Lyos pondered the feasibility of consuming the dragon part and wondered about the quantity of meals required for the task, prompting incredulous responses from the others. He defended his reasoning, asserting the strategy as the most viable among those considered thus far. He reflected on the natural act of consuming a life to incorporate it into oneself, a practice they'd been engaging in throughout their journey. However, he noted the daunting scale of the endeavor, estimating that the massive body, weighing over three tons, would take nearly two years to consume if each of them managed to eat one kilogram daily. Marcel pointed out the impracticality of the timeline given Farland's current state. Since she highlighted the necessity of enlisting assistance, indicating that the time had come to leverage the relationships he had cultivated. He was confident they could find individuals willing to lend their support. Lyos considered the orcs as potential allies, given their robust appetites, which could significantly aid their cause. Additionally, he noted that although the inhabitants of the Golden Castle may have diminished appetites, their numbers and livestock could compensate for this shortfall. He also believed that Namari, Soro, their companions, and even Kabru, who had shown a keen interest in consuming monsters, might join their cause if approached with a sincere request. Lyos mused on the advantage of garnering support equivalent to an additional company strength. Their strategy became clear. Firstly, to liberate the winged lion in prison within the dungeon's depths, then enlist its aid in vanquishing the mad sorcerer, and finally, to rally allies for the daunting task of consuming Farland's draconic portion. Energized by this plan, Lyos felt a surge of optimism about their chances of success. However, Izutsumi likened their ambitious plan to organizing an extensive feast, underscoring the monumental effort required. As this plan was being formulated, the elves initiated their mission to seal the dungeon. Accompanied by Soro, Namari, and Kabra, they ventured into the dungeon's depths. Soro immediately sensed an unsettling atmosphere, to which Namari responded by noting the air within the dungeon had become stale, indicating significant alterations since their last visit. She cryptically suggested that Soro would soon understand the full extent of these changes, though she expressed certainty that these alterations would not be well received by their companions. The elves followed closely as the group descended further into the dungeon. Like and subscribe for more.